Good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs regular City Council meeting of April 7, 2022 to order. Uh, all of those who can, please join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A couple announcements as we get started this evening. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner is under the weather. She is going to attempt to uh, join us uh, virtually for a couple of portions of the agenda, but we're not quite sure if she is going to make it, and we certainly wish her nothing but uh, a speedy uh, recovery. <clears throat> this evening, uh, we are going to begin uh, concentrating solely on issues related to the College of the Desert. We will begin with public comment, but public comment only from those individuals who've indicated that they want to make comments related to the College of the Desert. When we have completed all of the public comments, we will turn uh, the floor over to representatives of the College of the Desert. We expect to have individuals from their executive team along with Chairman Perez and uh, virtually uh, Trustee Yant. Once they have completed all of their presentations, we will then provide an opportunity for city council members to ask questions and to offer uh, comments regarding uh, what we hear this evening and any uh, questions or concerns that have emerged earlier. Once we have completely finished the agenda related to the College of the Desert, we will resume with our normal agenda depending on the time that it takes before we are able to complete uh, the COD portion, we may very well be taking a break uh, before we're resuming with the full agenda. So with that, I'd like to ask the city clerk to please uh, first conduct a roll call, and then we will begin with the uh, uh, public comments. Council Member Holstedge. Here. Council Member Kors. Here. Council Member Woods. Mayor Pro Tem Garner's absent. Mayor Middleton. Uh, excuse medical and mayor and mayor's here. Thank you. All right, uh, City Clerk, would you uh, begin with uh, uh, public comments and ask and start making phone calls to uh, those who are outside the chambers? If anyone is in chambers and wants to make a public comment, we would like to begin with those who are in chambers. Patrick Service. Yes. Okay, you may begin. I know most of you, but uh, my name is Patrick Service. Uh, I'm born and raised in Palm Springs. My family's been here for about 67 years. They began Las Casuelas restaurants. Um, I'm very fortunate uh, as a member of the Palm Springs Unified School District alumni to have had some pretty great experiences after the fact. I went to USC Business School undergrad, uh, and then I also went to a hotel school in Cornell. So I went there for graduate studies. And uh, not any slight against my undergraduate studies, but the emphasis of um, having so much applied theory and in-person learning and on the on the topic, uh, working live uh, education uh, set me up immediately right after hotel school to jump right into industry. Um, and something else that I would like to say is that um, hospitality training, hospitality administration isn't so much a, you're just geared to work in a hotel or a restaurant. Um, I, you're, you're looking at um, a service process that is analogous to pretty much any industry. So if you're gonna be an architect or a CPA, all of this will help you. Um, I think, uh, and I implore whomever is uh, in charge to stay the course with the hotel. Um, it's really important that uh, our kids hear 
that I grew up with who now have their kids that are growing up here have abundant opportunity and there's abundant opportunity here in the tourism industry. Um, if it is a permanent solution for them, it's something that they really enjoy, they really want to do, it's available to them. If it's something that's a jump off point where they learn leadership and responsibility, how to manage a team, that's also an incredible option that springboards them. They want to leave the valley, they can do that. You can go anywhere with this profession. So uh, I just implore those, this is such a, a, a gateway, not necessarily uh, in terms of, I'm not coming here from a economic recovery thing, but investing in our kids and our future, it's uh, abundant opportunity for them. Davis Meyer. Good evening, my name is Davis Meyer. I'm Director of Partnership for Visit Greater Palm Springs. Hospitality is the number one industry in our valley, creating over 53,000 local jobs with many more in the pipeline from new developments. There is no greater industry of opportunity in our valley for our students. The Visit Greater Palm Springs Board and JPA Executive Committee voted to support the Learning Hotel and Hospitality Campus by dedicating staff and resources. We have reached out to COD requesting stakeholder meetings, including employers, regarding the hospitality campus and learning hotel, and have yet to hear back. Visit Greater Palm Springs is committed to seeing that this campus is a success for our students and our community by contracting with One Future Coachella Valley to help us engage students and develop hospitality career pathways, raising funds through our Tourism Foundation for hospitality scholarships, dedicating a full-time position to this initiative to work with COD, One Future, and our local school districts, contracting an agency with experience in this topic to assist us with building a campaign to educate students about these career opportunities, filming the many hospitality success stories from across our valley, and creating a network of ambassadors to help mentor and assist potential hospitality students. The hospitality industry and Visit Greater Palm Springs will use every resource possible to ensure the Learning Hotel in campus will be successful. Thank you. Ron DeHart. Mayor, council, staff, I'm Ron DeHart, Palm Springs resident and a candidate for City Council District 3. I have two sons, one in high school and the other a freshman in Sonoma State. I'm what a community college graduate looks like. I was able to work, go to school, and be active on campus because the community college was accessible. I could leave work, attend class, and return to work because the campus was on our side of town. Watching college leadership in recent months, I question the inconsistent decision-making process as to which projects move forward, are canceled, or are put on hold. The reason given as to why the West Valley campus was put on hold was that the college has experienced a 35% drop in enrollment and that student expectations for higher education are changing. If that's the case, why weren't all expansion projects put on hold for re-examination and further due diligence? How could an athletic field project move forward that wasn't even an item on the capital project's priority list in 2020? If there were so many questions and concerns about enrollment, how is it possible that a playing field was added to the list during a COVID pandemic? Why isn't the athletic field project also on hold pending the results of the consultant studies? The last recession, we experienced declining enrollment and facility expansion continued all based on the understanding that students were still underserved and lacking access. This strategy and increasing wraparound student services for students led COD to be the state's fastest growing college. This was a proven winning strategy. COD, I ask, why are you stalling on projects and limiting access instead of focusing on strategies to serve more students and the local community? Thank you. J.R. Roberts.
Esteemed council members and staff, um, I am here tonight in my capacity as a 20 year resident for the city of Palm Springs. And I'm asking you tonight to take a look at something that may not come up with respect to the College of the Desert. So while the College of the Desert fiddles around deciding whether it's gonna fulfill its promises to the city of Palm Springs and give us the campus that we essentially paid for, there's another issue that I'd like to see uh, brought up tonight. And that's the issue of the 100 plus acres on the north end of the city of Palm Springs, which the city of Palm Springs purchased and handed free of charge to the College of the Desert. The College of the Desert is now in negotiations, in contract with the developer to sell that parcel for over two times what the city paid for that parcel, meaning that the College of the Desert will pocket millions and millions of dollars on a parcel of land that the city gave them for a college. I think it would be a great idea and time for some goodwill with the College of the Desert to give that land back to the city of Palm Springs so that the city of Palm Springs can do something important with that piece of land since it's no longer going to be a college. This is an important area of our town where many underserved lived. Be great to have some affordable housing or some other real community purpose there, not to be handed to some developer for profit. The College of the Desert really needs to rethink this and rethink this immediately. Thank you. Dieter Crawford. Good evening, uh, council, staff, uh, community members. Uh, my name is Dieter Crawford. I live in the Desert Highland Gateway Estates neighborhood uh, where my family's lived for over 60 years. Um, my family came to Palm Springs in the early 1950s and settled on Section 14 of the Agua Caliente Indian Reservation. And um, it's, it's just funny to hear the city of Palm Springs complain about COD being transparent and playing politics. Um, now, now you guys see how we feel. Uh, you do the same thing to your residents. You've been doing it to us for years. Uh, you pull items from the agenda last minute. Uh, you only notice meetings 72 hours in advance. Uh, they're just giving you a dose of your own medicine. So um, with that being said, we definitely need a West Valley campus and um, for uh, COD in Palm Springs. And uh, as JR said, if we're gonna uh, give that farmer property at Indian and Tramview to a developer, uh, we wanna see uh, affordable housing in there and inclusionary housing where 30% uh, of the residents go to, to, to low income families as a community benefit since we'll no longer uh, get the college. So um, we won't have that educational opportunity in our neighborhood. So we just wanna uh, see some self-help housing up there. Uh, so that way our community members could have ownership and uh, build wealth maybe uh, something of the sort that we did in the past with Coachella Valley Housing Coalition. Uh, once again, my name is Dieter Crawford. Thanks for your time and consideration. Sunshine Edwards. Thank you for your time, Council. I took the time out of my day to offer public comment at a recent Board of Trustees meeting. I am in s that Trustee Gonzalez, in her trustee comments, dismissed mine and other comments by saying they were just from Palm Springs. She forgot that all residents in this valley pay the taxes that fund the bond measures and that all people's views should be heard and respected. Likewise, President Perez dismissed comments about people in the West Valley paying property taxes, saying they have more money and, unlike the East Valley, don't want a Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal? Was that some type of joke? I'm still confused. Still not laughing. There are also a disproportionate focus by the trustees 
when they speak publicly about the learning. Boutique Hotel, the learning hotel is a very important component of the West Valley campus. But the initial plan proposed by COD for the campus, and a reminder, it is COD's plan. It's a much broader plan. But let's focus on all the elements and not the mischaracterizations, one to distract the attention. To be very clear, these are COD's plans that trustees Perez and Wilson repeatedly voted for, the arrogance and attempts by them to divide the valley and publicly dismiss residents' questions and concerns is appalling. I hope that the city council can get answers tonight. Let's talk about the elephant in the city, that ugly gaping hole, the downtown site. Trustee Gonzalez recently stated that she wanted to use the bond money for the downtown revitalization of cities throughout the valley. I gasped when I heard that. Does she understand what her role is? This is not economic development funds for urban renewal. These are funds to build colleges and a future for our students and our children. If urban renewal was the goal of the COD board, which is most definitely it's not, they should start with the abandoned West Valley campus site in Palm Springs. It really is a disgrace to a beautiful city. Ironically, before they demolished this existing building, Your time is it up, housed. Thank you. Thank you. Megan Rodriguez. Greetings, city council members and other members here. My name is Megan Rodriguez. I live in the North End. I'm a disabled um, Air Force veteran. And I've been living in the North End for three years now. However, my family is, has lived in the, era, in the area for about 15 to 20 years. Today, I'm advocating on behalf of a permanent college campus on the North End. It's hard for our residences to logis logistically attend um, CLD campuses that are located in the Palm Desert area. We do want a standalone campus in the North End as previously planned and promised to the residences of the North End. We want classes that are not just about hospitality that serve low wage labor, but we also want classes that are about innovation, technology, and promising careers that our younger generation can look forward to. The campus was once going to be behind Desert Highland, and it was going to be for tech, solar, and wind. Half of it was going to be a solar farm. However, the deal fell through with Edison, and then the whole plan was essentially scrapped. To us, we lost an economic benefit to the residences there. And basically to our future generation. Now there is a developer who is taking over that um, area by the wind farms. And although we are okay with um, that happening, so to speak, we do want to demand about 30% of the housing to be given to um, our residences in some kind of programming format so that our residences are not pushed out of the area, but can also afford new development and housing. Your time is up, ma'am. Thank you. Kathy Warmick, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. 
Uh, Madam Mayor and Honorable Members of the City Council, my name is Kathy Warmick and I'm Chair of the Planning Commission. I'm speaking as an individual, but informed by issues that I've heard on the dais in the Planning Commission. Today, I'm asking COD to return the 127 acre site, which was the former college site in North Palm Springs to the city of Palm Springs. We need that land. We need that land and we need that land um, that the city purchased for the college at no additional cost so that we can plan and work and put in housing that residents in the north end of Palm Springs can afford. We need housing built by Habitat for Humanity. We need housing where the city can use its funds that are already in the land to reduce down payments for residents. We need affordable apartments that we can use that if uh, that we can use tax credits to help build. Uh, that land needs to be returned to the city. Uh, it was given only given to the college as uh, land for the schools, and you shamelessly abandoned it and the minority community that surrounded it at a time that you were going to provide tech, solar, and wind um, education. You chose another location. You did nothing in the way of reparations for that community. And at this point, it, it will fall to the city to plan that land. We think it is outrageous, and I think it is outrageous, that the city, that the college plans to sell that land given to them for a dollar purchased by Palm Springs for $2 million uh, and, and reap $7 million in benefit only to build housing that will not be affordable for that surrounding the community. If COD board has any morals, any sense of uh, humanity, any sense of equity, that land needs to be returned to Palm Springs and happily with the proviso that we use it to build affordable housing. Uh, I also wanna say that I very much support uh, building the college as it was originally planned uh, in the current Palm Springs campus. Uh, there is no reason for this project to be stalled. Thank you so much. Michael Braun, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you. Um, Mayor, Council Members, and College of the Desert Trustees, my name is Michael Braun. I'm president of Grip Development, a real estate development company located in Palm Springs with over 300 tenants in the Coachella Valley. That includes the Rhone Hotel in downtown Palm Springs. One of our key selling points to attract quality restaurants national tenants and the Kimpton brand to downtown was a planned COD campus in Palm Springs. The hospitality world has changed in the past three years. Today's tenants need an educated workforce to execute their business model. The number one priority for restaurants, hotels, including retailers, is to protect their brand. This can only be achieved with an educated and well-trained workforce. In the case of the planned DOD campus, it is more true than ever. If you build it, they will come. Look into the future. Students from all over California and beyond will come to Palm Springs to receive a hospitality, a certificate they can use to find work, not only in the Coachella Valley, but anywhere in the world. Thank you for your time. Luz Delgadillo, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Luz Delgadillo, a COD alumni and local property manager. I wanted to comment and express how the planned COD hospitality learning campus is essential for our hospitality workforce and continued future growth. Hospitality is the number one industry in our valley, which means it offers more opportunities locally than any other industry. 
There are many good paying careers at the world-class hotels, restaurants, venues, and attractions located right here in our backyard. We are doing a disservice to the youth in our community by not having better educational opportunities available locally that can provide can prepare them for these careers. So much of the attention in education is on traditional learning settings and majors that are claimed to lead the highest paying jobs, although those jobs don't exist here in our valley. The hospitality campus and learning hotel offer students an opportunity to advance their career potential in a real life practical learning environment. It offers the opportunity to find careers here where they grew up if they so choose or anywhere in the world. The proposed campus also offers an innovative opportunity to prepare students for careers in vacation rental property management. We are a resort community with nearly 6,000 vacation rentals across the Coachella Valley. Hundreds of vacation rental property managers are employed locally, and there is no standardized, relevant, or localized training. These careers pay well and benefit our community when done right. Better hands-on learning in a controlled and professional environment where the training is being taught the right way by experts who know our community and our industry would help elevate the experience exponentially, not just for guests, for homeowners and neighbor as well. This is about what's right for the people in our community and the opportunity that exists here. With this proposed hospitality learning campus, COD is poised to be a visionary leader in experiential education that transforms the lives of people in our community and facilitates future growth for years to come. Please see that Palm Springs Hospitality Campus and Learning Hotel are built as promised. Thank you for your time. Kelly Stewart, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Good afternoon, City Council members, staff, and ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kelly Stewart, and I'm the proud general manager of the Ritz-Carlton Rancher Mirage, and I also serve on the Marriott Business Council of the California Desert. There are four realms of an experience, and that's education, entertainment, escapism, and aesthetics. The richest experiences encompass aspects of all of these four realms, which is what Coachella Valley is all about for our future students and citizens. My team and I at the Ritz-Carlton are passionate about the need for the College of the Desert Hospitality Campus and Learning Hotel, and for this project to move forward in service and hospitality. We are 100% behind the local schools and will provide resources. We want to offer students more than entry-level positions. We can offer them long-term careers that, with growth potential in our industry and our company, and that, that is exponential. The Ritz-Carlton and Marriott, Marriott Hotels will offer these resources for the Valley students through internships. We are passionate about mentoring and educating and going into the grade schools, junior high schools, and also the high schools to create awareness and excitement about the hospitality industry and what this campus will offer. And every, all the education in this valley with COD and CUSB. We, through internships, can provide hands-on, real-time experiences for the students that can gain experience and garner more skilled positions, including entry-level management positions for graduation and allowing faster advancement. And this is our investment. For reference, my resort, we currently have 57 managers. Half of those managers live here and are educated in this valley. Yesterday, we had 21 very excited students from CSUSB that have been at the vocational level at College of the Desert, and now they're at CSUSB and a minor in, in the hospitality program. We had a tour. We educated and had fun. Some of those, you know, definitely were about changing lives for our ladies and gentlemen that are in our valley. We see this as a learning center, not only as our future pipeline for leaders, but an opportunity to build the income of future families here in the Coachella Valley. I thank you so much. David Weiner, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Good evening. My name is David Weiner. I'm an 18-year resident of Palm Springs and a longtime community activist. I'm taking tonight to item 3A, where I'm eager to hear directly from President Garcia and Board Chair Perez as to why there is all this talk about sharing the love and spreading the bond funds across the valley. In 2016, myself and almost 100,000 other residents and taxpayers of the Desert Community College District 
voted for measure CC, which was explicitly marketed to voters as a bond measure to, among other things, allow for a complete build out of the Palm Springs campus. As we all know, there's a $22 million hole in the middle of our city, and that is not acceptable. Recently, there has been a series of statements made by Dr. Garcia and others on the board that could be characterized as misinformed at best, deceptive at worst. Let me address some of these points briefly, because I have been very disappointed to hear several trustees mischaracterize our valley and attempt to divide our valley between east and west. Trustee Perez said that students and people in the East Valley are poor and that those in the West Valley have more money. That is patently untrue. The facts are that 97% of students attending PSUSD are eligible for free and reduced meals. That is more than any other school district in the Valley, including Coachella Unified. Trustee Gonzalez recently said that West Valley residents asking that the promises made by the college be kept is directed against the East Valley and that the question of President Garcia about her actions is racist. That is highly insulting and patently untrue. It is appalling to listen to these efforts to separate our valley. There are many people and organizations working hard to make this valley a strong, cohesive unit. I lead one of those organizations, and I work every day to try and continue and expand that work. There's a clear pattern here on the part of some COD trustees to avoid serious discussion, and when pressed, they fall back to charges of racism in East versus West. We are one valley. Do not engage in tactics to try and divide us. Thank you. Lori Kibbe, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you, and good evening. I'm speaking tonight to request that the COD meetings with community groups need to be meaningful and deliver real information. The meetings between COD and community groups need to involve an exchange of ideas. To me, those community outreach means setting up discussions with different groups across our valley. This can include Chamber of Commerces, hospitality and restaurant employers, or street associations like Paseo and Main Street Merchants. Our valley certainly does not lack for its great organizations. We should have a two-way detailed discussion about topics relevant to each of these group, groups. Instead, what has happened is that COD leadership has limited the public to two to three minutes of public comment at their monthly board of trustee meetings and tried to limit the number of people making comments. Engaging employers is particularly critical to this process. These are the people who will be hiring our students and our other uh, residents. Valley employers know what the labor market demand is. They know what skills are needed in order for students to secure well-paying jobs. However, when the public tries to engage the College of the Desert trustees, they are rudely dismissed. During a recent board meeting of the College of the Desert, instead of responding to and addressing comments from the public, such as a request that college staff provide additional information, at a future meeting, Trustee Gonzalez, in her remarks, rudely dismissed the people offering the comments by stating they were uninformed. No explanation of why or any detail about what she believed was said was incorrect, just a very rude dismissal. How does this help build a useful dialogue with our communities? As part of our tonight's council meeting, I request the council ask COD for a town hall format meeting that would involve members of the council, President Garcia and COD trustee board members. All we are requesting is to have conversations. I don't believe that is too much to ask. My hope is that this evening we can get answers to the questions we've been asking and come to an agreement on a better format for future meetings designed to gather valuable information that can be used to develop CAD programs in a meaningful way. Thank you. Shannon Anderson, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Good evening, my name is Shannon Anderson and I'm the General Manager of Hilton Palm Springs. Thank you for taking my call. I've worked in the hotel industry in Palm Springs since 1991 and while there has always been a need for hospitality employees, that need is higher now than it's ever been. The success of our valley has been built on hospitality, and the name Palm Springs is known as a resort destination throughout the world because of it. We need to support this campus as it is essential for our entire valley's future growth. By attracting, engaging, and educating students in the world of hospitality, 
we will be shaping the future hospitality leaders of our destination. COD leadership needs to make good on the promise they made to the taxpayers of Palm Springs and our industry. Thank you. Peggy Trot, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Will you please mute, you? mute your audio first? I'm sorry? Make sure your audio is muted first, please. Thank you. You may begin. Don't mute your phone, just your, your TV. Thank oh, you. Oh, I'm not, I'm not in front of a TV. Uh, my name is Peggy Trout. I'm the general manager of Kimpton Row in Palm Springs and a resident of Palm Springs. I have been in the hospitality industry for over 30 years and uh, recruiting qualified candidates has always been an issue and currently is the worst I have seen. Keeping students engaged starts with keeping them in the community, which is why I'd like to ask the leadership of COD to fulfill their promise campus in Palm Springs. Thank you and have a great evening. James Williamson, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Dr. Garcia has publicly said that decisions need to be data-driven and that's great provided the COD leadership is looking at the right data. Trustee Gonzalez recently commented that they had data on student enrollment by zip code and was requesting enrollment by course. However, current college enrollment numbers are very limited in terms of telling us about future demand for courses by students. Dr. Enders, the, the college's interim director of institutional advancement, recently highlighted that very fact. She said, and I quote, Transportation can be a significant barrier for some students. Providing services closer to where our students live and work reduces that barrier. She said this in relation to students in Coachella and was highlighting that their lack of transportation was a barrier preventing them from attending courses at the main college campus in Pan Desert or even in India, which is only five miles away. The corollary of that point is that when you look at current enrollment data for students living in the West Valley, it will, of course, be lower because we don't have a campus and many students don't have their own transportation. Students living in the West Valley are being denied an education by COD leadership because the West Valley campus is on hold. As of today, no money has been appropriated, no architect is working on plans, no project manager has been hired. Not a single shovel is in the ground. The inaction of the COD Board of Trustees has put the future of our students on hold. And any sense of urgency by them is lacking. I implore the council to do whatever you can to have the college move forward on the West Valley campus as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Jenny Fote, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you for holding this most important session. It's Jenny Fote, and as you know, I'm a former member of the City Council. And having a campus in the city has been the work since 2004, when former Mayor Odin and I negotiated for and was promised a Palm Springs campus. 18 years, two pieces of property purchased, and over $50 million spent, and we have nothing. Today I was driving by the ugly fence site of Tuckwitz and Farrell and got excited to see a tractor moving on the property. Finally, I thought, but unfortunately, at closer glance, it was moving trees right in the middle of nesting season. I've come to expect that things happen at COD behind closed doors. So why wouldn't I believe that it was a tractor beginning the campus? Which brings me to discussions by COD leadership must not be held behind closed doors. Transparency is an overused word, but what it means here is that a public entity making major decisions about spending our tax dollars are required to have decision discussions in public. As an example, at a January 2022 meeting of the COD Board of Trustees, it was shared that both the West Valley campus and design and the cost of increases of the Automotive Academy in Cathedral City were discussed in a closed session meeting by the Board of Trustees. 
totally illegal under the Brown Act to discuss property except for cost and terms. I've done it through all the board, excuse me, I've gone through all the board of directors minutes and agendas. I can't find when or why the vote was taken to stop work on the West Valley campus. Information that relates to stalling and or abandoning projects previously agreed upon in public cannot be done in private. The latest example of lack of transparency is that COD leadership has refused to produce a copy of the contract for the additional studies and assessment that they claim they need to evaluate the West Valley campus. How are we to determine whether the scope of that contract, whether it's necessary for work that I very much doubt is needed, is appropriate? Please ask Dr. Garcia to produce the contract. And I really appreciate your having this and would really like another public forum if we don't get all of these answers tonight. Thank you. Jerry Keller, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you. This is Jerry Keller from Lulu, California Bistro. Our restaurant needs educated and trained assistant managers that can become managers and general managers in the future. As of now, there is no program like that in our valley to train students, and many of them will stay here when they graduate. Our industry and support organizations have pledged money and human resources to be sure this program will be successful. We've paid thousands of dollars in taxes over the years to get this project moving. And as of now, it seems to be changing and not being carried through as it was originally promised. It's vital that we have this program, the hotel, everything we need to train students to become assistant managers and stay in the valley and grow with us. Thank you very much. Mike Lewis, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Thank you. Hi, everybody. This is Mike Lewis, the general manager of the Palm Springs Tennis Club. I've worked in hospitality for 25 years, and 20 years I was, has been in the desert. Um, I did vote for Measure B in 2004 and Measure CC in 2016, uh, and I do expect for the West Valley campus to be built like the voters approved and were promised. Uh, when the campus is built, I fully support the building of a learning hotel at the campus. Uh, there's only so much you can teach in a classroom setting. Students need, need the hands-on education so they know how to deal with the many issues that come up in the day-to-day -day operations of a hotel or restaurant. Uh, role playing in a classroom does not compare to the real thing. Uh, when it is the campus is built, the hotel should not be on the chopping block. That is a key part of it. Um, we need new young hospitality professionals to support the growing tourism business in the whole valley. Um, and the campus uh, will be a great contributor to this need of uh, the growing hospitality. And it's also just not young people that attend COD. Many adults, like myself, attend, have attended COD and, and will attend COD, especially if, when you have campuses throughout the valley. Um, I also have concerns about how the taxpayer money has been spent so far on the West Valley campus. The December 14, 2021 Mass Capital Project Report, which is a report prepared by the college's independent consultants in charge of the campus project development, states on page 8 that spent $9.6 million with a remaining budget of $332.6 million. But then a week later, on December 12, 2021, at a Board of Trustees meeting, the construction presentation on page 35 states that it spent $43.4 million with a remaining budget of $345.5 million. So within days of each other, why do these numbers differ so significantly? How is it possible for them to not know the total budget of the project? One report said $332 million and the other said $346 million. So the question, one question to the board is how much has actually been spent? One report, $9.6 million and the other report, $43 million. So that's definitely a question we need them to answer. Uh, the public has a right to know where our money went and how it's being spent. And I'd also like to remind the, the trustees that College of the Desert stands for the whole desert. It's not the College of the East Desert or the West Desert. It's the College of the Desert. And I thank everybody for their time. Thank you.
Barbara Lampert, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you for giving me some time to speak about this issue. Um, Trustee Gonzalez recently stated that she wanted to use the bond money for the downtown revitalization of cities throughout the valley. And when I heard that, I, I was just gasping. Does she understand what her role is? This is not economic development funds for urban renewal. These are funds to build colleges and a future for our students. These are the funds that I've been paying through my property taxes for education. As a doctor, believe me, I understand the importance of educational opportunities. If urban renewal was the goal of the College of the Desert Board, which it most definitely was not, they should start with the abandoned West Valley campus site in Palm Springs. It's a complete disgrace. Ironically, before they demolished the existing buildings, it housed two career vocational colleges offering courses in healthcare business and technology. So not only have they failed to build opportunities for our young people, they have actually taken them away. Trustee Gonzalez also recently wrote that, quote, I never knew that it was our responsibility to serve as an employment agency, unquote. She apparently does not think it's the college's job to help students acquire skills and knowledge that will help them in the job market either. I would suggest that the trustees focus on what they were elected to do and leave issues of city renewal to the local governments where there are experts. Thank you very much. Claire Grant, you're live with the city council. You have two minutes to give your comments. You may begin. Thank you very much. I'm Claire Grant and I've lived in Palm Springs for most of my life. I attended Palm Springs High and started my college career at COD, so it's a subject very close to my heart. Deeply troubled by the lack of transparency demonstrated by the COD board. The decisions that they've made recently and are continuing to make are being made without any kind of public input or vote. COD is not a private institution, yet it's acting like one. It's acting like a secretive private organization. It is a publicly funded college. The situation is even more troubling when you hear quotes by President Perez, who when asked about these issues surrounding COD by a television interviewer, responded with, quote, it's not my fault, which really is all I have to say to that. It's a, that's a remarkably childish response by somebody who's running a public institution of the size and importance of COD. Decisions regarding public education in the Coachella Valley have to be aired in public with input and discussion by the public at large. That is the job of the COD board, and I don't understand why they are being allowed to run this university in secret or run the college in secret as they're doing. Thank you very much. Arturo Hernandez, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Thank you very much. My name is Arturo Hernandez. I'm calling in um, to simply say three things regarding the situation that involves the city of, of Palm Springs as well as COD. I'm a long life resident here of the Coachella Valley, living in Palm Desert for um, over 20 years and having worked in Palm Springs for again over 15 years. I want to encourage the Palm Springs City Council to do the following. Number one, continue open communication with COD to ensure that there is transparency in the steps that are necessary to move forward with the projects that are being discussed, understanding that students need to be at the forefront of all decision making. Number two, to allow the new leadership at COD the opportunity to move the promises made forward with the full understanding that the previous leadership left many of its constituents unaware of the reality that changes were made to the plans before the new leadership transitioned in. 
And thirdly, to focus on the new leadership at COD, beginning with Dr. Martha Garcia, by allowing her to speak and present, but most importantly, to share her visions of the new campus without interfering and without preconceived ideas of what her, her intentions are to better our community. Lastly, I want to encourage the Palm Springs City Council to keep in mind that the seeds of conspiracy was planted by the previous president as a way to divert attention and cause chaos, which I have been reading in the newspaper, I have been seeing on Facebook, on social media, and it all needs to stop. This conspiracy theory of whatever had been said in the past by Thank the you, excellent previous president needs to stop. Celeste Brackley, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Um, hello. Um, I was just thinking that if the plan was to move forward with this hospitality school after studies, studies are updated, why was Doug Watson, who led so much of the effort, uh, why was he let go in December? And it certainly um, raises a big red flag and uh, what on what COD's intentions are. Um, furthermore, I'd like to state that as a hospitality leader, um, it is important um, for the, us to have educated hospitality students that we can put into management or pre-management positions. Thank you. Bruce Hoban, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Bruce Hoban? Bruce, are you on mute? One moment, Mayor. We're attempting to reconnect. Charlie Irvin. Hello, Mayor. May excuse me. Hello, Mayor. City Council members, it's good to see you guys finally back in the chambers, uh, community as well. Uh, today I'm here to talk about uh, the COD campus um, with, as well as the general plan. Um, first, I want to talk about the uh, COD campus. Um, I just want you guys to remember, uh, keep in mind that uh, Desert Highland uh, community also has property um, that has not um, been used. Uh, COD is currently under contract, as you heard. Uh, with the developer to build there. Um, we would like for that property to go back to the city. Um, we would like for you guys to do everything you can. Um, in the 19, uh, 90, 1995, uh, Desert Highland had uh, properties that were on Rosa Parks as well as Granada, uh, Core Zone, and uh, there was a few others that were RGA6. Uh, the city of Palm Springs decided to change those properties to RGA1, um, excuse me, R1s. So they took away the housing from the community there in Desert Highland. Um, it, it was a travesty. Uh, the, the boxes were taken away from the, pulled from the homes. They weren't allowed to be able to have any electricity or anything on the homes. So they were forced to turn those properties into one unit. Uh, they had a certain amount of time that they had to uh, comply. If they didn't comply, those properties were taken and they were turned into R1s. Uh, our community has suffered. Those properties are still sitting vacant. That has been since 1995. Uh, we're still, we've been pushing. Um, the city and everyone else is, is pushing for housing. This is a perfect opportunity to switch those properties back and activate uh, maybe possibly getting some investors in there or maybe some, some people to do some building in our community, uh, maybe get us some more four units, maybe possibly even building up. 
Um, it's, you know, something that um, I've seen the city has done recently where we're changing zonings. So I just really would hope you guys take in consideration in a general plan, uh, take that into consideration. And once again, that those streets are Rosa Parks, El Dorado, uh, Tranview, Corazon, and also Rosa Parks. So my name is Charlie Irvin. I'm a, a planning commissioner and also a member of the Desert Highland community. Thank you. Bruce Hoban, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Thank you. I'll resume where I, the call dropped. I was talking about closed session agendas. Similarly, Jeff Baker, who is interim president of COD, shared that he had provided design updates to the board and the facilities update report in closed session in June of 2021. Again, this item was not on the agenda and updates on projects and discussion of the cost of the building are not legally allowed in closed session. Only property negotiations relating to price and terms may be discussed in that forum. At yesterday's special board meeting, B. Gonzalez instructed the clerk to display memos that were, quote, hidden from the public, unquote, and the links, quote, were removed, unquote. But these memos were not part of the agenda information provided to the public 72 hours before the meeting. How can some members of the board claim they are open and honest and then make hidden memos come to light? B's next comment is out on the agenda Agatha Christie novel. Why couldn't we share these, this memo with you before today? Why? And the president or Garcia, why didn't you ask the question? You, you can see that these are just causing more distrust. I don't understand why there's no dialogue between the trustees when there's a surprise like this yesterday. These are the only occurrences that we know about because COD leadership noted them in answering other questions. My question is how many more discussions were illegally held behind closed doors? How many more, quote, hidden, quote, memos are out there that you have not seen? How many times did the COD board misuse the privilege of allowing, being allowed to meet in closed session? Please fix this. Thank you. Dahlia Rodriguez, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Hello everyone, my name is Dahlia Rodriguez. I'm a first year student at COD and I live on the north end side of Palm Springs in a low income neighborhood and I have lived here all my life. I wanted to share my thoughts about the Palm Springs COD campus and why I think it would be beneficial not only to me but to other people around. My sister, my neighbors and other people in my neighborhood attend COD and my brother, my cousin and their friends have all mentioned their future plans to attend COD as well. This campus would be so much more closer to all of us and the accessibility of this campus would motivate many more to attend. Having this campus will help us with gas expenses, flexible time schedules, and just time in general because of the commute. I know this campus is only set as of right now to just focus on certain areas, such as hospitality, media arts, healthcare, and sustainable technology. But if other courses were available or even just general education classes, I think that it would help us all. Being able to have these educational resources close by is so much more motivating to us students, and as a student from a low-income family, it would help a lot. 17.3% of the Palm Springs population and 20.1% of the Cathedral City population is below the poverty status, so having this campus closer to us would be beneficial. I hope this campus is thoroughly considered because it would make a great attribute not only to the city of Palm Springs, but to the current and future students of COD as well. Thank you. Juanita Garner, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Uh, I have worked in education for over 20 years, and I have had the honor to see children go from kindergarten to college graduation. But sadly, I have seen many more um, who come from very hardworking families end up with very low-paying jobs simply because they couldn't afford to further their education. Many people see the west end of the Coachella Valley and see only wealthy people, but that's not true. We have many, many children, and many children who are not able to fulfill their dreams because they can't afford that, that education. The campus out here at this end of the valley would be 
such a tremendous help. All you have to do is visit any of our schools to see how important it is for us and for this part of the valley. Perhaps uh, Trustee Gonzalez uh, said it right, we are uninformed. So if we are uninformed, then inform us, create meaningful dialogue. There are many groups waiting to engage. In the list of values for College of the Desert, it states in part, it will be a center of collaboration and innovations for educational enrichment, economic development, and quality of life in the Coachella Valley and surrounding communities. We value the thoughts, words, and actions of our students, colleagues, and community. We communicate with authenticity in pursuit of broad understanding and effective dialogue and inclusive decision making. This is right on your website. Please live up to those words. Does that conclude your comment? I guess so. Madam Mayor, that concludes public comment. Thank you, and I want to thank everyone who came forward to provide public comments. Uh, and uh, with that, I would now like to turn over uh, the microphone to uh, President Perez, uh, to Trustee Yant, to uh, President Garcia, and to any other members of the COD community that uh, are going to be presenting. And let me start by saying to President Perez, thank you for being here. We appreciate uh, you joining us and uh, being a part of this community conversation. Uh, well, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Middleton, uh, honorable council members, residents of Palm Springs, and members of the greater Palm Springs community. My name is uh, Ruben Arias Lam Perez, and I'm board chair of the College of the Desert Board of Trustees. I would like to thank all, the, all those that commented for their civic engagement, as well as all of you up on the dais for your civic duty. Um, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Uh, with me, I am joined by Mac McGinnis, who is the Vice President of, of Moss and oversees all of our construction projects, as well as Trustee Yacht, Superintendent Dr. Garcia, Vice President Dr. Tafoya, and Vice President Ramont, who are joining virtually. And thank you for that accommodation today. Um, our presentation today is for informational purposes and the furtherance of the 80-minute presentation and discussion at the Board of Trustees meeting on March 18. The presentation for which can be found on our website uh, via Board Docs. Further, this information is subject to refinement throughout the process identified in this presentation. While this is not a Q&A, upon the conclusion of the presentation, we'll respond to questions as best as possible. However, we may not have all the answers to your questions tonight. We will continue to keep you informed, and there will be much more opportunity for input and collaboration throughout the process moving forward. College of the Desert is pleased to have the opportunity to provide this update and to show that it is absolutely committed to the Palm Springs campus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide provides a, a brief history of uh, project changes in site location, evolution and programming, uh, the global pandemic, and a turnover of college proposed uh, personnel. Next slide, please, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mac McGinnis, who will be able to uh, talk a little bit more about the history of the projects. City Council and guests, my name is Mac McGinnis. I am the uh, bond program manager of the College of the Desert um, for the last 15 years, uh, and I am vice president of the Moss Companies. We're consultants to College of the Desert, managing the design and construction of all the projects. The slide we have here is the first iteration of the um, project that was planned on North Indian and Tramview there. Um, what you see is a full build out of that uh, site there. The uh, plan was to develop about um, 50,000 square feet. So if you see the most eastern building there, the little small building, that was what was planned originally uh, because of funding. And uh, but that. Uh, shows you the full build out. Uh, that started in 2010, and uh, by 2012, it was submitted to the Department of State Architect for review, and plans were approved in 2013. So, next slide, please. So, the second iteration uh, 
is uh, exercise at the uh, now Palm, uh, the mall site. In 2015, the West Valley campus um, a master plan was completed, actually it was completed in 2016. Uh, the master plan uh, describes uh, providing general and basic skills education plus targeted academic um, uh, uh, areas, as you can see there. An architect was hired in 2018 to produce the program document, and at that time the name was upgraded to the um, Palm Springs Development Project. Next slide, please. The third iteration, uh, as you see here, um, was uh, this is a sketch from a group. There was a um, there was a uh, competition that was uh, uh, performed by three different architectural firms. WRNS won the competition, and so they became the uh, architect of record for this for this project here. Uh, during this phase, the uh, there were some additional funding requirements. Uh, that became apparent, and, and those were um, due to uh, funding sources. Uh, in 2018, the district developed a strategic a strategy to build the Palm Springs in multiple phases rather than trying to construct the entire campus at once. The phase approach um, to the project was necessary to better match construction expenditures with the projected debt insurance uh, debt issuance schedule because the, this ensures that the promised rate to the taxpayers of no more than $20 per uh, $100,000. Um, so that would be honored. Uh, the next slide, please. What you're looking at here is uh, a look at the, um, uh, you're looking south at the uh, accelerator project, or accelerator building, and you can see how uh, it's, uh, there are overhangs there to provide some of the shading strategy. So you see some of the indoor and outdoor spaces there. Next slide. This is a slide looking uh, south, uh, focusing on the stadium type seating that is actually inside the building, but this is another view um, uh, of the accelerator project. Next slide. This is a view from within uh, inside. Um, so it's a, um, a porch to the makerspace area. This is a space where students can gather and uh, talk with one another between classes. Next slide. Um, so this is a site plan, the last site plan that was developed. Uh, and you see all the elements that were part of this. There was you know, the accelerator on down to the hotels and villas there, one through 10. It's showing a unified uh, roof plan stretches uh, across the, the project there. The next uh, uh, piece is this uh, accelerator plan, level one, shows you some of the interior spaces of the accelerator. And there you have um, different spaces like a maker space and digital media and um, other technology uh, pieces in, in that floor plan there. So if you go to the next one, this is a campus view. Um, looking uh, southwest, um, from the southwest. So you can see at the bottom of the, uh, of the picture there, the long uh, rectangle there, that was the mobility hub. Then the larger piece there going north is the uh, accelerator and terminating at the hotel and villas uh, to the north there. Uh, the next view is a view um, actually from the west, not the east, but it's from the west looking east. Again, the accelerator uh, to the right and the villas and hotel to the left, along with the convention center um, and a, uh, uh, out there in the middle, the kind of a red piece there. So the next one is a ground view from Farrell. This is going to be the entrance to the new campus off of Farrell, although there are, there are a couple of other entrances from uh, um, Bristol and Tokwitz. This would be the main uh, entrance, uh, the address, if you will, for the campus. I turn it over to Trustee Perez. So the question arises of will the Palm Springs campus be built? And the, the answer is, uh, the simple answer is yes. The campus will be built. Uh, College of the Desert is committed uh, to this project, and we still plan to focus the, the campus on the academic areas of hospitality, culinary arts, film, media, digital arts, healthcare, and sustainability. Plus, we will consider if other programs should be offered and needed uh, general education courses. 
As an example of community partnerships that we plan to prop, uh, propagate, we wanted to mention the 1.6 million Economic Development Administration EDA grant that we applied for in partnership with Visit Greater Palm Springs. Through PACE, we're working with Visit Greater Palm Springs. We plan to develop the hospitality industry, industry training program that is a dynamic employer-driven skills training program. The program will create a partnership between College of the Desert's Partnership and Community Education, PACE, Visit Greater Palm Springs, VGPS, the Coachella Valley's Destination Market Organization, and Coachella Valley hospitality businesses, including hotels, resorts, restaurants, attractions, etc. This strategic initiative is one of the many ways we can work together to support and guide the local hospitality industry through business downtairs and ensure resilience within the industry. A stable and trained workforce is critical to this effort. So what will the, the campus look like? Um, learning labs will be built, but we are carefully navigating the planning of a learning hotel to ensure that uh, legal and prudent use of funds are being used. We are exploring different alternatives to creating a learning hotel, just, such as a partnership uh, with uh, Marriott or Hilton, and uh, we are currently exploring those at the moment. I'll turn it over to uh, Mac McGinnis. Okay, so what you see on the screen now is a proposed phase one project. Um, so the decision has been made to build the, uh, the site and the, the project in phases. So you can see here in phase one, they have the accelerator project, mobility hub, maintenance and operation. And what's being studied right now, whether to have the culinary institute or culinary of arts, a separate structure or combine it in the uh, accelerator itself. So those are being studied right now. Uh, the next one is, is this it right? Yeah, oh, uh, okay. So what is the scale of the Palm Springs campus? So the initial budget was about $300 million. And, and then the, now the current budget is three, a little over $345 million. Uh, as you can see, Measure C was 577860000 and the amount spent to date of the $34,408,000 um, includes the, the cost of the land at the, the mall site itself. So it's not just uh, money spent uh, working on the project. This is something to actually buy it. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this bond measure CC is funded by the property owners spanning the nine cities and unincorporated areas throughout the Coachella Valley. Uh, the amount in the capital report is 30247256 is from the March 1 and does not include encumbered funds. But um, best reference is moving forward will be the capital projects report to the Board of Trustees. Each year, the district engages an independent firm uh, to perform annual audits, annual bond audits report to each measure. The links to the most recent audit reports are posted both, uh, and both measure, uh, measure B and CC audits are completely clean and reported. The district has properly accounted for the expenditures held in the measure and, uh, and that such expenditures were made for authorized bond projects. The next slide is how long will the Palm Springs campus, uh, how long until the Palm Springs campus is built? As you heard earlier that there's uh, companies doing feasibility studies and cost of ownership and things like that that were not done up front, um, but they're being done now. But we are start engaging the architects now to work on some planning ideas so that some of the stuff can happen contiguously. But uh, right now we have, a completion estimated late summer of 26 to spring of 27. Our goal is to work simultaneously on as much as possible while progressing on uh, the phase one plans. The college is reviewing all previous concepts, designs, and plans, and we're seeking additional uh, faculty and staff input, gathering feasibility data, and developing a total cost of ownership plan for the entire district, including the Palm Springs Development Project. Once complete, the Board of Trustees will review and approve all campus plans, and then they will go to the Division of State Architect for final approval so we can commence bid bidding and construction. A virtual community, uh, community forum is expected to occur, occur in two, uh, summer of 22. 
summer of this year. So uh, how will info about the Palm Springs campus be shared publicly? College of the Desert has opened meetings for its Board of Trustees as well as the Citizen Bond Oversight Committee. Both groups receive updates in public session on construction projects and bond expenditures that include information about the Palm Springs development project. And all that information is available online. The Capital Projects Report is intended to be an ongoing update on all projects. Also, we do share that info on uh, the Board of Trustees presentation and live links are shared at the bottom of, of this presentation here. Uh, plus, the, the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee has agendas, minutes, and annual reports posted on their website as well. So uh, We are looking forward to uh, collaborating and engaging with all of you to continue College of the Desert's work to expand opportunities for higher education. Our organizations are critical to each other's success and we're eager to work in collaborative partnership. Um, while this is a summary and not a Q&A format tonight, we'll be happy to take feedback at the community forum to come and through engagement with stakeholders. As you can see, much planning has occurred over the years and College of the Desert is certainly committed to this project. Again, thank you for allowing us to join you today. I apologize it took us a while to get here due to scheduling conflicts, but it was certainly important for us to be here today. For me to show face and reiterate our committed commitment to the Palm Springs project. I'm looking forward to working with you all in good faith. If a question is asked and we cannot answer it tonight, then we'll note that question and discuss it with the district's team and we'll be back with an answer. But we also have um, members of our administration here to answer any questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Perez. Uh, does uh, Trustee Yant or uh, President Dr. Garcia wish to uh, make any comments? I would just like to express tremendous gratitude to the city council and to the community members for uh, their input tonight. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, you or your folks would like to make before we move on? No, just th thank you again for, for allowing us to be here. Um, we understand the importance of what this means to the community of Palm Springs. Well, we can appreciate that uh, this isn't a Q&A, but we are going to try to go through a few questions. Uh, we've not had the opportunity to have this engagement and to have it uh, in public, which is where it belongs, and so we want to thank you. Uh, I'm going to get it started, uh, and it's not going to be a question. I've got a couple of comments that I want to make. Uh, it's It's been a long time, but... Uh, just over uh, 50 years ago, uh, I made the first step to be uh, anyone in my family uh, to attend college, and that was only possible uh, because of East Los Angeles Community College being in uh, the area in which I lived and being a school that would allow anyone to get in. Uh, I have some, uh, some thoughts about what it's like uh, to be the first in your family to attend college. And I know for so many of the students at COD, that's their experience. They are the first uh, to step forward. Uh, it's a whole lot easier when you've had someone else in your family to pay uh, to provide that way. What we care about deeply, and I believe this is universal across all of our communities uh, throughout the Coachella Valley, is that students and the children in our area have an opportunity to grow and to develop in ways that uh, their parents and grandparents never dreamed of. Uh, that's why this campus is so important. One of the things that was absolutely remarkable to me uh, in moving into the Coachella Valley was the extent of community support uh, for the College of the Desert through direct philanthropy, through individuals that uh, had the means to send their children to uh, any university anywhere in the world, still were putting in great amounts of time and attention uh, to making sure that the College of the Desert was uh, an exemplary institution. That's shown in the growth, and it was shown in the kind of support that COD received in 2016 from throughout this community. 
many of us are concerned that that support is at risk. And we want to try to get it back. Not only do we want to make sure that the campus gets built in the West Valley, we want to make sure that we restore the level of support that historically COD has had throughout our community. Uh, anyone, and I don't have to tell you, those of you who are in education, how hard it is to pass a bond measure. But CC didn't just pass uh, uh, with a small margin, it passed overwhelmingly. And we don't ever want to lose that. So with that, that's the spirit in which we're approaching these conversations. Uh, how do we partner, but how do we make sure that the commitments have strong timelines and that the campus that gets built is the campus that was talked about in 2016? With that, I want to turn it over to a couple of my colleagues to, to begin some questions. Uh, Council Member Holstage or Council Member Coors? Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your leadership. Um, we very much appreciate you being here in person to listen to our residents. And you heard um, a bit today, um, I know it's probably more public comment than you typically get at your meetings um, because we hear them. People come to us um, as a city council, right, um, to talk about access to education, to talk about the parcel, to talk about, you know, their concerns about what they're reading um, and hearing. So really appreciate you being here to clear that up. Um, and I just have some clarifying questions, if I can, um, for the public. So, um, you know, we heard about the project being put on hold or being paused. Can you just clarify for the public sort of what happened there and what was the decision and, um, you know, what happened in that decision? I'll, I'll turn that over to Dr. Dr. Garcia. Yes, uh, we are currently reevaluating the planning information that was previously collected and as stated by uh, Mr. McGinnis, uh, going through the process of developing a total cost of ownership plan. And that's not only for Palm Springs. It is important that I highlight that it's for the entire district. Once that uh, information is uh, finalized, presented, then we'll proceed with our plans. And at the same time, it is important that I highlight that faculty had been involved uh, in a limited capacity. The faculty that will be teaching at this site uh, are currently um, working with Dr. Tafoya and other consultants to ensure that their input is uh, provided as we finalize plans and move forward. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and one of your slides said the updated feasibility information will if inform exactly what the new campus would look like. Can you just describe for the public what that means? Dr. Tafoya, can you uh, elaborate on that, please? Absolutely. I think the easiest way that we can explain is that um, the feasibility information that we had that was um, not really designed completely as a feasibility study, but as a um, piece of the planning was from 2016. And so what we're trying to do now is affirm that the information that we had from 2016 is updated and that we make sure we take into account that any new changes that need to happen based on new needs and new labor market information. So as was referenced by many people in their public comments, the field of hospitality has changed. And that is what the purpose of our feasibility is. It only makes sense that we need to update that since the information is older. And a, a way to sort of give an example is um, in education, we use underwater basket weaving. So we would not find support in our um, feasibility for a program like underwater basket weaving. So that's what we do is we compare the data and make sure that the programs are going to best serve our students with that information. Thank you. That's really helpful. And maybe for the public, if I could just ask everyone to say their titles and what they do for sure. COD, just so everyone understands who's who and who's doing what. If I could ask Dr. Garcia and others. 
Good evening, all. I'm Dr. Garcia, and I have the privilege of serving as the superintendent president for College of the Desert. Right, John, one of the trustees. Hello, everyone. I'm Christina Tafoy. I'm interim executive vice president, College of the Desert. Good evening. I'm John Ramont. I'm the vice president of administrative services for the college. Thank you. Sorry, I should have done that at the very beginning. Um, so you're talking about the feasibility information. So could you just describe what data you're looking for in that feasibility assessment? So you described a little bit, but what are those data points that you're going to be assessing? Yes, absolutely. I don't know that I can name them all off the top of my head, but certainly I mentioned the labor market um, information and that we do for every single program that's being considered, as well as points like our um, demographics, the uh, things that were mentioned today, um, information about um, how people travel from one area to another so that we're making sure that we're including um, logistics in the information. Um, we also want to make sure that our financials line up with what we're planning in terms of um, the ability to sustain the campus that is built. So, for example, we take many of us for granted things like custodial or public service. And those are items that we need to take into account with our study to make sure that um, we appropriately would staff whatever is eventually constructed. Thanks, and is that the assessment you do for every campus or every expansion? I think it's fair to say that um, it varies depending on the campus because of the size and complexity of each project. And that this one is certainly a much larger project than many others. And that that is one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we include all aspects of data and be sure that we're planning the right programs. Um, we even heard today great input about making sure that we offer more in the way of general education versus some of the programs that we had specifically um, planned. And um, all of that together is how we make sure that, again, we're being um, prudent and planning appropriately for the campus that is to come. Thanks. I'm going to ask this because I think I heard it in public comment and I've been asked it a lot. So was that updated feasibility planning done for the NDO expansion or other projects that COD is moving forward on now? So what I will share in regards to specifically NDO, NDO had been, planning process had been completed uh, it had been the request for approval to the division for state architect had been submitted prior to my arrival. It was approved soon as, after I was uh, um, hired. So if, if and, and very candidly, if, if that had happened for uh, the Palm Springs site, there, we would not be having this discussion today. We would have moved forward with ha what had been approved for the division, by the division for state architect. Thanks, that's helpful. And will you do that for the Cathedral City campus that you're the Roadrunner campus that you're now discussing moving forward with? Uh, conduct a feasibility study. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, we have obviously evaluated labor market information. We have uh, definitely uh, reviewed uh, thoroughly our enrollment. Uh, we have uh, reviewed several components of a feasibility study, but not, uh, not as thorough uh, to the extent that, that uh, we are conducting uh, the feasibility study for um, the Pons Frank site. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know um, we don't want to grill you, but I just want to, it's better to ask it out and open and just clarify for the public because we're just hearing so many of these questions from our residents. Um, so just, I have a few more clarifying questions when I watch the presentation that the public might have. Um, so the photos you showed, sort of the designs um, of the future campus, are those current campus that's approved or will those designs be affected by the feasibility study? 
want to respond, Dr. Tafoya? Sure, sure. Um, what you saw today were the latest plans. Um, they have not been approved by the board. If you've been following what the board has said, they have not had not seen until um, last month in March a full presentation on where we were on the project um, and the full, um, particularly the villas that had been planned as part of um, the architectural drawings. What the feasibility information will give us is, um, yes, it could affect what the campus ultimately looks like, but I think that it's more so the programs that are offered. So it's less about the pictures that you saw, which are more about the exterior viewpoint and more about what happens on the insides of those buildings. Um, I think the the part that you're you're going towards is probably related to the learning hotel, which you heard um, in the presentation is something that we're uh, planning for uh, an additional phase and that the um, concerns are that we make sure that we have a legal use of the bond funds and that, um, again, we are being prudent with the taxpayer dollars. Um, I know that there's a lot of uh, concern that the training will be hands-on and that's what we're trying to convey is that we will absolutely 100% have hands-on training, particularly for hospitality and culinary. But the way in which we get there is something that we're still working on. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and then the budget that you showed, is that the current approved budget by the board um, for the 354 million, I think it said, will that be lessened or reduced by the feasibility, updated feasibility information? At this point, that's the allocation, okay. $345 million. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just want to say I saw, I know that there is, um, we've had meetings to talk about the site and the, you know, trees and what some residents have called blight on the site. So really appreciate you um, and your leadership working on that with us to make sure that we can secure the site. You know, obviously our residents are concerned when we hear um, that this might not be completed until 2026. Um, and so, you know, concerns about what's going to happen uh, through the site. Have you thought through, and maybe we can talk about this later if you don't have an answer, it sounds like you'll do a forum um, and work with us, but the access to education for our residents um, who are very much in need of access um, in the interim, so what students here are going to do. My husband graduated from Palm Springs High in 2004, um, so it's hard to imagine, right, the bond measures and the money that's been allocated and the really the, frankly, generations of students who graduated in, in Palm Springs and Desert Hot Springs and Cathedral City and the students who live throughout the valley who work in Palm Springs who haven't been able to access um, COD in that time. And I'll just say this is personal to me because I know of um, family friends and many people who've had to drop out of COD because they can't take a 45-minute bus ride from Palm Springs to Palm Desert. And I know that seems it's hard to imagine that burden, um, but really we do have a huge amount of need um, to, and equity to address in this city and in this whole Western Coachella Valley. So could you uh, talk a little bit about that? I appreciate your question and I highly encourage our students that or potential students that live in Palm Springs to attend our temporary site. We're currently offering courses there and are glad to serve you um, in uh, a facility that's being obviously currently um, utilized to offer access, access on site. Um, it's located uh, on Bristol, and uh, I look forward to seeing uh, some of our future students there. Like I said, we're offering courses now, um, and we encourage uh, students who experience transportation problems to uh, contact us. We'll provide additional information and guide them to that specific site and provide uh, details in regards to courses that are being offered there. We are currently open in Palm Springs. Thank you. Appreciate that. And just what sharing what I've heard from residents is it's um, difficult to get, you know, the full course availability on a temporary campus. And that's why a permanent campus is so important to us. Um, 
So I'll just say thank you so much for your commitment to regional equity, to uh, the students of the Coachella Valley. I know um, we all want the same thing in terms of addressing the access to education and making sure every Coachella Valley student has access to COD and can find good paying jobs and careers, um, which those of the people who grew up in this community know are just too hard to access. Um, and you know, you heard from our residents, people calling in. I think that this is actually one reason I ran for city council. So I'll just take a minute to say um, there's a sense that Palm Springs has incredible wealth. Um, and we do have some residents who have incredible wealth. Um, but I've been a poverty law attorney in the Coachella Valley um, for 10 years. I've worked in Coachella. I've worked in the Eastern Coachella Valley on incorporated areas. I've worked with domestic violence victims in Palm Palm Desert throughout and Palm Springs and um, there is significant poverty and need in this valley in, in Palm Springs and in the western Coachella Valley Desert Hot Springs and so we're just um, really concerned about um, the access that our students have um, to your institution and we appreciate you working with us on that to, to alleviate that, that demand. Thank you. Great. Um, Thank you for being here, uh, two of you in person and the four of you on Zoom. Um, and it's great that we can make a hybrid meeting like this work for everyone. So uh, the need for more technology education is here because uh, this is a great step forward. Uh, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, I do have a couple questions and um, some of them also uh, to give you a chance to respond to what we're hearing. And I know uh, Councilmember Holstage and I have had the opportunity uh, to have meetings every other month. Um, and this is the first time our residents have been able to, um, you know, speak in, and I appreciate you uh, being here to listen to that as well. But, you know, there are a lot of comments about, you know, tr of course, transparency or decisions being made out of the public view in closed session. I really want to give you an opportunity, you know, to respond to that, and especially sort of the question that I get the most, um, and there are a couple, but let me give you the ones that I get the most, which is, um, how was the decision made to stop the design work, what was happening on the West Valley campus in Palm Springs. Who made it? Where was it made? I get that a lot. So um, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. And um, I don't know if you were even here when that happened, Dr. Garcia. I presume the two trustees you know, were probably here. So whoever's the best person. Um, but I think that would really go a long way to addressing that concern uh, that you heard tonight and that we, we have heard quite, for quite some time. Well, we, we have a, a bond attorney that, that sits with us in closed session, and he, he advises us, and we've, we've never had, he's never advised us of a, a board, uh, a Brown Act violation or anything that would, would um, construe as a Brown Act violation. As for the, um, the, the pausing of the Palm Springs campus, I think our, our superintendent president may be best suited to answer. And, and I'll uh, defer to Mac because obviously there were decisions that were made prior to my arrival. Um, so can you share on, I, I understand Mac from our discussions that definitely COVID had an impact, but can you share that for the record, please? Yeah, <clears throat> there's a number of reasons. Uh, one, you know, we, uh, there was a change in administration. And so, um, some of the decisions that need to be made um, needed to be made by, or what the, the, the district wanted to be made by the new president. So there was a pause. I mean, we continued working a bit on the project, but there were times when we had to have direction from administration. So, um, and we were in the pandemic situation. So everybody was trying to adjust to that. So um, there was never a pause to, decide whether or not to, whether to do whether to do the project or not to do the project and uh, I will say my first meeting with Dr. Garcia she said to me we're committed to doing that Palm Springs campus and that's all she's ever said to me so um, there was never a pause to decide whether to do it or not to my knowledge there was no never that no, and I appreciate that I guess what I'm trying to get at was sort of what we're hearing which is um, and whether it was allowed or not, uh, Trustee uh, Perez's point, but so was there direction in closed session? Was There doesn't seem to be any public minutes, any meetings, and so people are asking when, who made the decision? Was it sta a staff decision? Was it board direction? Was there a board vote? So we're just, that's what I'm trying to understand so we can let the public 
and the media answer that, because that has been a question we've seen in the media as well. Maybe, uh, Trustee Yant, you, um, you may have more information, because as Dr. Garcia explained, she wasn't there during that time yet, when that was you know, put on hold. Dr. Garcia, go ahead. Yes, so like I stated, regarding the pause uh, related to COVID that happened prior to me, but, but it is important that I uh, communicate to the community that the recommendation for additional analysis on, uh, on analysis on the planning came from me. Uh, that when I realized that we need additional input from the faculty in order to be ready, to move forward to submit a final plan to DSA, um, that that obviously recommendation came from me and uh, was communicated uh, to the board. And therefore that's the reasoning why you see uh, and have the opportunity if you have not seen to access the thorough presentations that have been presented to the board and will continue to be presented in a public manner because it is important for all of us, for the trustees and myself, uh, that you all have access to thorough information uh, that is being communicated publicly. And we appreciate that and appreciate you know, uh, the decisions you made. I guess I was trying to get before you were there when sort of the design team you know, stopped doing work and um, was that a board decision? I mean, that's what I'm trying to uh, find out. And, those were not board decisions. Those were done by the previous administration. Okay, so when President Kinnaman stopped the design work is what? I would say uh, the, it happened during the, the interim. The interim, okay, thank you. Um, so that was separate from the board. He made that decision and just informed the board? Correct. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. That's, uh, and I appreciate what you had to say, Dr. Garcia, sort of what you did, that, um, that's helpful. And a couple people mentioned um, you know, the designs, and we saw the designs today, you know, uh, that you showed, and we've seen that in um, some other meetings and, and other times in the newspaper previously. Um, and there are a couple comments on this, and I actually watched the meeting when question of um, the board having not seen them, and uh, the interim president, Mr. Baker, said they did, um, I think in June 2021, during a facilities update and closed session. Um, and so I was just trying to understand that. Is that sort of, are there regular facilities updates like that in closed session or? To my knowledge, uh, Council Member Kors, none of the trustees recall getting a presentation from Interim Vice President Baker regarding that. Okay. Same for you, uh, Trustee John. I, oh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Okay. I can't say yes, I can't say no, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, um, and Dr. Garcia knows because I invited her to come to uh, visit Greater Palm Springs where I chair uh, the Joint Power Authority, the government side of, of that. And we heard from someone from there today. And I know since we started meeting, I think late November last year, you know, we've been you know, asking and I know uh, the tourism um, experts uh, who have a lot of economic analysis uh, have been asking you know, how we can Work, work together, whether it's a, you know, um, a committee, you know, to provide information. I think the city managers raised that at all of our meetings. Um, and we heard today that, um, you know, the, the tourism industry, and there are other industries as well, right, who are the experts. They know what the markets look like right now. Uh, you can get data as well, but, you know, obviously as things reopen, things are different than they were in 2020 when a lot of the restaurants, hotels were all closed. Uh, and so um, maybe you can sort of share, because you've been through this kind of process, because I, I really think it's sincere, and I think you know that, that we want to partner, right? We want to be helpful. Uh, I know um, for Visit Greater Palm Springs, they want to be able to provide you um, information and expertise, and I know a lot of them are committed right now to saying the number of folks that they can work with. I know that uh, Scott White, the CEO, reached out uh, to connect you with some of the hotel programs. Uh, as well, um, and we've had some calls with some very successful hospitality schools that have hands-on learning, which um, I think Dr. Garcia, you told us that would be great because it's a first, right, that in the community college in uh, California and would attract students to want to do that. And so um, just want to sort of follow up on that to see 
is there a way we can try and do that so we have that partnership? Because then when we get questions, we know the answers as well. Uh, so maybe I turn that over to you. <laughs> Yeah, if if so, I might, Mayor and Council, it's it's not every day that community colleges have these wonderful plans to expand. Um, it just so happens that I've been through one very similar in Arizona. And, and actually, it was very similar in the kind of community conversation we see taking place um, in Palm Springs, Cathedral City, and the West Valley as well. Uh, one of the things that was a real game changer in that process was the college there in Arizona had decided to create a committee comprised of local officials and local stakeholders. Some of those were residents um, who wanted family to you know, be able to go to a community college. Some were representing industry that would be providing the jobs for some of those individuals. And to clarify, it was certainly a conversation about expertise. So there was some really rich conversation actually about design and kind of you know, how to put programs on the ground. But it was more of a way to change the community conversation from one that we're seeing here to one where uh, there was kind of a richer partnership, uh, a seat at the table, so to speak, to be part of the conversation happening at the faculty level. In that instance, the college had been taking trips to best practice example campuses across the country, sharing that information with those um, elected officials and other community stakeholders as a way to engage and partner and collaborate. And that, in turn, I think caused a lot of the residents that had expressed the very concerns we heard this evening feeling better about being part of the process through their local representatives. So um, I should make council aware that um, without getting too far in front of council, I had proposed something like that to Dr. Garcia and representatives of the college. Um, that was warmly received. Uh, they expressed gratitude for that suggestion. So hopefully that um, makes us optimistic that such a thing could be created. But I also realize that I haven't really closed the loop with, with all of council. And so it would be a good idea, I think, this evening, if you think such uh, a proposal should continue to be advanced and considered by the college uh, that you may want to weigh in on that this evening. And I can answer questions or expand on that, but I think you get the basic concept of changing that community conversation to one of, of a little more, you know, hand-in-hand -hand partnership and conversation. And I think, Dr. Garcia, you wanted to say something on that uh, as well. So. so I definitely appreciate the, the support and the interest in collaborating, and we definitely think it's a great idea. We'll... Uh, have a discussion as you are having uh, tonight, um, City Manager Clifton, uh, with uh, our board as well. And we'll proceed in and in, in formulate, uh, uh, obviously, a and an, a, an opportunity to receive input from the community, specifically from our experts. Uh, I would like to add that for the community's awareness um, that every career education program at College of the Desert ha currently has an advisory committee that is made up of industry partners. So we are receiving the input. However, we recognize the importance of, of uh, your suggestion and are looking forward to having that discussion with the board and, and bringing you uh, details in the future during our one-to-one uh, -one meetings. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And just from uh, visit Greater Palm Springs hat for a minute, um, you know they do great economic studies. They're willing to you know help fund studies, um, which would save uh, the taxpayer money from um, our students. And I think it could just be a, a really good partnership. And there's support for that, you know, from throughout the valley, um, you know, from folks there. Um, I just want to touch on one thing because sometimes the issue of you know regional equity uh, comes up and. Um, I think Councilman Holstage mentioned, you know, we have the highest um, levels of poverty in the West Valley, um, but the whole valley, you know, is right up, is in that high levels among our students. Um, but just for uh, the public, because you probably have this data, you know, um, there's coding that's done for all school districts um, for economically disadvantaged students who get qualified for free and reduced meals. And it's, uh, and all the numbers are awful, right? Almost 59% of students in California uh, qualify, 65.4% in the county, um, and those numbers are very high. It's 97.3% in Palm Springs Unified. Um, virtually every student, and they now provide it for every student, so there's no food shaming, 
um, who's attending schools, and you know, we're talking about Desert Hot Springs, Palm Springs, Cathedral City, uh, students in Rancho Mirage as well, and some unincorporated, are economically disadvantaged. And so the challenge for them to get to school, um, I appreciate even you know, Coachella next to Indio. It still is hard for folks when they're working, going to a community college, and why I think there's so much importance among, for all of our residents in the West Valley uh, to see this happen, and appreciate your commitment um, to the school. And you know, when you look at our nine cities, um, if you, you know, divide it into east, west, and central, population's about the same in all three regions. Um, and you know, one of the slides talks about 60% of the bond money from 2016 uh, being allocated for the West Valley campus. And there were some comments that that was wrong and needed to be changed and was unfair. Um, but really, that was promised in 2004 as well. So when you add those two bond measures together, it's closer to a third. Um, and when you add all the money that's been spent, including the first bond measure before either of those, um, and all the money that's been raised on facilities, if you look at right now in the West Valley, with 35% of the population, there's 3.3% of facilities, and those are all modular temporary facilities. So the equity is, is what it is, and I just wanted to point out for our residents and you know, for you that that's reason for the concern. Um, you know, there's great campus in Palm Desert. That's great. Um, personally, I'm glad to see the expansion in Indio happening. That's great. But the West Valley is still with some modular units in, in the three cities. And um, that's what we all want to work with you as you move forward to change that. Uh, because I know, and um, I can uh, look at uh, Trustee Ferris directly, we all care, and we've talked about in our meetings, we want to help our students. We want to help lift those in poverty out of poverty. We want them to get good paying jobs. Uh, and that's what we're all in this for. Uh, so we really welcome uh, you being here and we really want to partner and work together in the best way possible to make this happen. And as quickly as possible, of course, so we don't have more high school graduates not having that opportunity. Of, of course, appreciate your, your comments and your questions, Council Member Course. Looking forward to continuing the partnership and working together. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Woods. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for being here. It's really appreciated. And thanks for the work that you do for um, a large number of people in the Valley um, to get an education or to move on even to higher education, whether it be a vocational training or whatnot. Um, I don't want to repeat everything that Councilmember Coors or Councilmember Holstich said, but I think their statistics are very good and they're very powerful on why we need a campus here. Um, also, the industry that we have here, you know, and training. Um, our residents to go into that industry is very important. I wanted to add one thing that uh, neither of them brought up, and that is that you know we also, um, the school district, uh, COD, goes on the other side of the Banning Pass and brings kids in. And for them to travel even another 30 minutes to a campus you know, is cost prohibitive and there's not that much transportation between that pass. We're working on that with the train, you know, there's a bus, but it's important to have something. You know, 30 minutes is a lot of extra commute time uh, between Indio and, and Palm Springs. Um, I was really glad to hear, and um, I hope, um, Gar um, uh, President Garcia, that we do look at a collaboration. I think the city's put forward one option for that. And do you have another option that you might like to propose at this time? Or what is your, because you talked about collaboration, um, Trustee Perez, and I didn't know what that looked like to you. Sure. Well, uh, just continuing to be working with you in good faith. I know we have our, our two by twos on on a bi monthly basis, but we're definitely open to ideas of collaboration in any way. Okay. Good. Then I'll have the, the city manager. Maybe we'll take an action tonight to authorize you to move forward with something like that. Um, I, the other question I had, I think that I'm getting, is obviously a lot of money was spent on the design of the campus, which included this learning hotel. Um, to stop the project by this interim city manager or the interim president I think you talked about is a huge financial decision because your architecture for all of that has been completed, right? So now you're going to have to have a huge, if I'm understanding correctly, if you do this study, you may actually have to relook at the campus completely. Is that correct? The campus wasn't designed completely. We were just in the schematic design, even on the hotel, the entire campus. So the drawings you saw were just illustrations of what could happen. 
okay? Um, we do have uh, site plans and, and things like that. So, um, but uh, that's why we're taking a pause to study what we need to do. I, if you saw, I said, you know, we're going to study, should we move the culinary arch project into the accelerator or leave it out? Uh, we're looking at other programs. We're talking about an architecture program. We're talking about some other things that might be included in this. But this is the time to do it during schematic design. So if we wait until design development's over, if we're in construction documents, you're right. Be very, very costly to go back and redesign all of that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification mm -hmm. because it was an expenditure of money even to do schematic. No, um, to get the point, absolutely. it's not cheap. I'm, I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm right. just saying that it could be a lot worse. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, the um, so good. We can collaborate. Um, it's going to ca cause a redesign of the campus. I personally uh, think that the citizens of of, of the valley and, and, and uh, you know uh, of the valley and as a whole think an architecture program is absolutely lacking here. And, to, and, and it's such an important part of what drives part of our tourism market, not just hospitality, but architecture. And to create those architects, I think, is important to have that opportunity for people there, as well as the hospitality and the learning uh, facility. Um, you know, I know we were in a pause, and I know you've tried to get a timeline for getting out of that pause. Um, I was a little alarmed at um, some of the other comments from other trustees about what the purpose is of a community college. And I think some of the comments were brought up tonight. So I looked up the purpose you know, in the education code. And vocational training is one of those things. That's, you know, that's right in you know, the California Constitution or the California Code. Um, so to hear a trustee say that is, is disconcerting to a lot of residents um, about that. So just. You know, I don't, I don't, I'd, I'd hate the trustees to kind of get off base in any way and stick to its primary purpose of what it's supposed to do, which is, um, you know, part of its thing is, thank you very much for the person in the audience. <laughs> for some, so I just want to bring that to your mind as you talk about things is that, you know, you are under, you know, an obligation to provide some vocational training uh, to the residents of the Coachella Valley. And, and I'll leave it at that. I think everything else has been said on my part. So, the, oh, one more thing is as you move forward and if the feasibility or the study that you're doing um, causes a redesign um, of the campus, I would very, very much appreciate if you would involve us in the design process of that. And why do I say that? Um, if you look at college campuses, um, um, community college campuses across the state, some are beautiful. They open and they have their arms open to the community. They invite the community in. You know, it's a public space for a lot of people, concerts and whatnot. And um, other community colleges wall off the surrounds of it, right? And, and it, it looks like a shopping mall. And I would certainly hate for that kind of urban form to happen in a city that is so proud of its architecture. So I just ask you to keep that in mind. And again, thank you for being here. We'll do. Appreciate your, your comments and questions, Council Member Woods. Uh, thank you. As usual, most of the questions get asked uh, when uh, before it gets back to me, but I have a few that I would like to follow oh, I, I up on. I think there's a, um, Mayor. I think there's a hand up in the screen. Ah, excuse me, uh, Trustee Yacht. Yes. Could I address Council Member Core's questions again? Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this evening, we heard. Uh, you know, Jenny talked about when this project started, and I, I was involved with her when this project started with Mayor Odin. So as I've said at a meeting of, of the trustees, this has been a long project where by the time this projected date happens, we're almost at a quarter of a century. And I'm really anxious that this move forward. So to answer some of the uh, Councilmember Core's questions. The last meet, public meeting with community members was with the uh, selection of the architectural firm. And uh, Matt can confirm that that was in the uh, summer of 2020. So th that helps with the time. And uh, the last uh, presentation to the board was in the summer of 2021. So that kind of helps with the timeline. 
and to my knowledge, there was not a board of trustees vote or action to stop or delay the project. Uh, actually, there was a vote by the board to reinforce that this move forward. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions I'd like to follow up on, and I'll start right with the uh, timeline. Uh, it's perfectly understandable that when le new leadership comes in that you would want to take a look at uh, major uh, capital projects. And, uh, but between uh, that review, uh, the pause as it's being referred to, uh, and the pause that was uh, apparently necessitated uh, due to COVID, do you have a estimate of how much time has been lost uh, from what would have been the uh, original uh, completion date uh, uh, that would be estimated had we continued on uh, based on the schematic drawings that were uh, being worked on uh, back when all of this got paused? Um, in my estimate, so estimate only, probably we've lost about a year. A year. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, what steps, if any, can we now take uh, to accelerate the process to try to make up for some of that lost time? Well, I haven't discussed this with college administration, obviously, but there are steps during construction that you can, you know, uh, expedite things to, um, uh, to shorten the construction schedule. There's always opportunities there. There's a... Uh, other opportunities in the design process, making decisions quickly and, and stuff like that. So there are opportunities. And We're going to look at purchasing uh, maybe materials early, you know, so we have to wait on that. I mean, this labor market and, and, and material, I mean, it's, it's really a challenge. So, yeah. so I, I think all of us have uh, looked at any projects being built know that that's, uh, that exists. Uh, uh, the uh, capital that they have over there uh, for the new uh, sports arena is pretty substantial, but uh, we are seeing evidence of how quickly under some circumstances uh, folks can move and uh, anything that we can do to aid uh, picking up time. We know you want to act responsibly, uh, but we also want to be uh, helpful partners in making up for some lost time. Absolutely. All right. Uh, question for you. Uh, in all of the years that we've been involved in this project, is there anything that uh, COD has asked of uh, the City Council in Palm Springs that you've not received? You know, I, I probably haven't been on the board long enough. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Trustee Yant to maybe uh, answer to that. But from my understanding, the city of Palm Springs has always been a good partner and helpful. Uh, absolutely. No question. Okay. We want to remain that good partner. So we're committing to work with you. Uh, and if there is something that you need, get on the phone with us and, and we will work with you on it. Uh, I think the city manager outlined uh, a uh, very collegial uh, type of process uh, for bringing uh, the parties together. Uh, and that will be helpful in restoring confidence that we are uh, getting back on track. That confidence, uh, as all of us in public service know, uh, when you have the confidence of the public, uh, you can achieve an awful lot. When it's lost, uh, it's very, very difficult to get it back. Uh, and in some places, it's been lost. Uh, let me, do you want to? I was about to say, well, we hope to work with you in order to restore that confidence. Good. Uh, $345 million now that's been allocated, if, as I understand, for the uh, West Valley uh, campus. Uh, and... Is that based on a, a capital budget that you've been able to map out that you know this is what it is going to cost us or is that much more a broad estimate as to uh, 
what you have the ability to commit, but tell me a little bit of how you got that to $345 million. Well, it's through the design process, the programming and design process. Um, you know, we started out at three hundred million, and as we were designing, uh, it got. Matter of fact, it got over five hundred million with the hotel and and all of that stuff. Because there were some grand uh, ideas about the hotel, we had to scale all of that back. And uh, uh, matter of fact, at a time. Um, uh, you know, prices were escalating like crazy. So we had to pull a lot of it back and say, okay, what are we doing? And that's why we talked about a phased approach. Uh, maybe we could do phase one, then maybe phase two, possibly even a phase three. So, um, Good. Any, I'm going to ask uh, one last question for me. Is the West Valley campus going to be built? Yes, uh, we have our commitment. All right, thank you. Um, I have one more uh, I just remembered. Uh, you know, I think we, we talked about this in March for those of us, uh, for Dr. Garcia, uh, Trustee Perez, and uh, Council Member Holsters and I and the city manager, um, about trying to get some, some documents. Um, and, you know, I think Dr. Garcia and the city manager talked about doing it through a PRA, a Public Records Act request, so there's a record of it so the public could see. Um, and I know there's some documents, just like the contract with Cambridge or what the, what's exactly in it that we've you know, been asking for. And I just, if we can get an update sort of where we are and figure out if there's a way we could expedite some of that um, so the public has you know, that information. Um, you know, the stuff that's on your website, of course, they have that, and um, uh, Trustee Perez added, shared some of what was on the website. Um, I don't know if that's our city attorney or um, would sort of know the status, sort of when that we got, when we finally got the letter in, how long that took, and just sort of where we are in timing, and maybe see what we can do to try and, you know, expedite uh, that process. Um, according to our outside counsel who submitted the PRA request and has been uh, monitoring the responses, uh, the city has really only received about three or four documents that are not otherwise available on the district's website uh, in response to our, and that's in response to the city's uh, December 8th, 2021 PRA request. Since we're now at four months, is there, do you have a sense, Dr. Garcia, on timing or how we may be able to get, you know, the, the first group of documents, which is really about the West Valley campus. Um, so we have those as we're, you know, talking with you. That would be really helpful. So I'll, I'll confirm. Um, I was under the assumption that you have received an extensive amount of documents, but I'll confirm, obviously, with uh, the person that I have in charge on site and with the attorney who's also working uh, with that person. Okay. Yeah, so I appreciate you yeah. bringing it up. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, especially things around the, the study that you're doing now, because uh, that'll help us really provide input, even if, you know, during this whole time period, you know, that we can give input based on data we may have access or others may have access to that can inf help inform uh, the work you're doing would be really helpful for us. Thank you. And, and um, in regards to the Cambridge West contract, uh, frankly, that that will make sure we that it's submitted uh, tomorrow. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I forgot to mention earlier, so I figured this would give us an opportunity. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. All right, Councilmember Holstich. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just had a follow up question. I think for Mac um, for what you stated. So you talked about phase one and phase two and possibly phase three. So could you just describe? So I think you said phase one will be completed in 2026. Is that right? Do you have an estimate for timing about when the entire project could be completed? No, not at this time. No. So is it possible so that phase one will be completed in 2026 and then yeah, are I mean, there any, what guarantees can we tell our community, you know, about 
because I think when you say the project's paused or the project's scaled back, it's one thing to make a commitment, um, but really the timelines are important, right, to know when those commitments will happen. And sure. um, after, you know, 25 years of, of waiting for a campus in the Western Coachella Valley. No, I understand. Uh, at this time, I, I don't have a schedule that I could tell you at this point, but um, uh, I get, you know, we could talk with uh, the college administration and come up with something. But at this time, I, I don't know. Thanks. Does the board have to consider and approve each phase then in the design and planning process? Mm -hmm. So phase one is approved, but then the rest of the phases are not by the board. Is that right? Um, I don't know about the other phases yet. A phase one seems to have support of the district to move forward. So uh, after that, I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussions about what phase two is, what it looks like, how much time it's going to take, and, and all of that. Thanks. Will those discussions happen concurrently, you said, or will they happen after phase one is completed? Uh, I would imagine that they're going to happen concurrently. Thank you. That would be... I think the, the fear is that we've received promises about shovels in, ground, in the ground by 2022, and then, you know, it's scary to hear about um, 2026, and then, you know, potentially later for especially two-thirds of the project or a large portion of the project. Thank you. Um, and then, Mac, you said... Um, the f delay or the pause for the reason that it's phased for the hotel project is the concern about the use of the bond money and needing legal advice and analysis of that. Is that what you said? Well, not just that, our ability to draw down the funds. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Ramont could speak to that. Yeah. You know, if, the, if, if you have a specific question about that, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Um, the way the bond schedule um, was projected out, uh, the most de recent estimates that we have that um, we would be having issuances going all the way out to 2029. And the main reason for that is it's, it's kind of a simple thing that, you know, when we borrow money, as we borrow money, um, the taxpayers are obligated to pay it back. And we made a promise to the, the taxpayers that for Measure CC, it, the the taxes would not exceed twenty dollars per hundred thousand value valuation. Um, measure B was twenty five dollars per hundred thousand, which made a combined total not to exceed forty five dollars per hundred thousand valuation. And so it's um, we have to do our issuances um, in phases over time so that we honor that. And that's affected by a lot of variables, including interest rates and assessed values in the valley. So um, there's a lot of different variables that can affect that timing. But uh, the most recent estimate I have is we would do, a, our, um, the, the earliest we could do a final drawdown would be in 2029. Okay, thank you. And then um, you heard public comment about Desert Highlands and uh, the commitments that COD before you were here, um, before many of us were here, made to the city of Palm Springs. And we heard from former council members um, and community leaders about that. So could you just talk a little bit about COD's plans for that site um, and you know what you might do moving forward, considering the city um, paid $2 million and gifted that to COD? knowing and expecting that there would be a college campus built there to do economic development and um, access to education um, in that community specifically. So I, I think we're limited in what it is that we can say publicly about that, but I do want to uh, reiterate the commitment that once we do sell that property in North Palm Springs, all that money that's used that we get from that property is going to be in turn um, paying for the, the Palm Springs development project, the Moss site. So we plan on using that money that we, we were to earn off of selling that property and reinvesting it back into the Palm Springs Moss site. Thank you. Thanks. In, uh, and I know there are going to be limitations on what you can say, uh, but uh, there is a very strong desire uh, to see affordable housing built in uh, the area north of the Desert Highland community. And I encourage you, as you are talking with potential 
uh, buyers to ensure that it is truly affordable housing that is contemplated. Yeah, yes. I just need a little clarity. I'm a little bit confused, and I'm sorry about that. If I'm confused, I'm sure others are confused. You went through a schematic process. You spent a ton of money doing the schematics, right? Um, you now have moved into this study that you want to do to see what you need and all the criteria. But now you're talking about phase one. Is that designed already? No. Okay, so just... Tell me again what phase one is. It, there's no, so the schematic is out the window, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, no, the schematic's not out the window. We're going to utilize as much, as, as much of that as we can. Uh, schematic design is, uh, happens right after programming. Programming right. is you find out you know, the needs of uh, the spaces and things like that, programs. And then schematic design, you start designing something to incorporate all of that. So uh, with the change, with, you know, um, with the funding challenge and stuff like that, we were only about 30% uh, because we'd have to draw back about 30% uh, complete with schematic design. We went up to, to about 50% or even 60%, but we had to draw back because of the changes. We never finalized anything on the hotel or the villas or anything like that. It was still very much in flux. But on the accelerator project, which we were focusing on because that's the building that teaches the, the students, we were a little bit further along on that, and then we were given direction, focus on that because that was going to be the phase one uh, project. So I'm so, still very confused, and, okay. and I'll give you... Um, you're doing this study to see what's needed, is that correct? What's needed at the campus as far as programming goes? The feasibility study is something, uh, like Dr. Garcia said, it studies demographics, it studies traffic patterns, it studies transportation, it studies a number of things, uh, and including cost of ownership. Because building, it's easy, but how are you going to maintain it over years? So we're trying to get all that information. Now, most of what we're getting uh, may or may not change the design. Right now, it looks like we're, we're trying to go through an exercise to see if we can't fit the, the programs that we have into the building we have. Um, but we're not, we're not there yet, so we're, we're, we're studying that so that we don't have to go through a redesign process. But then what is phase one, and, and how do you justify phase one? So phase one was part of the presentation. It was the accelerator building. It was the um, CPU, the uh, utility plant, central utility plant. It was a maintenance building. It was um, the transportation hub. It was the front entrance, the culinary uh, uh, arts uh, project. So you're saying that's not changing? I don't think the, um, the program is changing, no. But we may have to, because remember in the presentation I said, we're studying whether we can take the culinary arts program and put it inside the cell accelerator or leave it out. So we're studying those things. We'll bring it in. Some of the things would have to change, but if we leave it out, then we may not have to change it so much. You mean leave out the culinary arts program? Not leave it out. Um, incorporating it in the accelerator building, which was the larger building. So the culinary project was a smaller building. We were looking at if we incorporated it in the building, um, we're studying to see if that's beneficial or leaving it separate. So again, we're just now studying that. So there's, it seems to me there's two components. There's the programming, what does the community need, what it, you know, and you're, you're doing that study. Right. And then there's the physical build out of the campus to meet that need, right? Right. And you've, this is obviously we've gone through a very long process. We've heard tonight many, many years uh, to get where we're at. We've spent millions of dollars to get where we're at. So what's the next steps? Uh, you're going to do this study. Um, but, you know, you really, if you're doing a study, it seems to me you have nothing. Everything's open to discussion. Is that what's happening? Uh, like I said, the study's focused on those, th those uh, items that uh, I described. So right now what we're doing, we're having meetings right now with the faculty, as uh, uh, Dr. Tafoya said, to include some of the faculty input that wasn't included uh, before because the programs have changed. So we're going through that. We're not sitting waiting for the study. We're, we're moving forward with meetings and, and planning. 
Okay, and, and so I think, you know, just uh, um, I, I take it back to Trustee Perez, you know, that's, we, we would like to be part of that. You know, we'd like to be part of that process. And I don't think we're part of that, at, you know, by, by, by us, I mean the city of Palm Springs. Part of that process and, you know, our committees and our residents. So, but, you know, it's, it's, it's confusing as to what's really going on. And I think if we can clarify that, it would be much better. Dr. Tafoya, do you want to chime in for any clarification? Thank you, yes. I, um, I'd like to hit it from a more layperson perspective. Um, the idea that we are throwing away what has already been planned is inaccurate. We are not throwing away. That's why we shared with you the designs up to this point. When we're talking about the feasibility, we're not talking about starting from scratch. We know that there was information that supported what was currently planned. What we're saying is that that information was primarily from 2016. We're affirming. And then in the conversations about finalizing the design is conversations like um, Mr. McGinnis said is that we had a um, culinary arts building that was a freestanding building. So when he was saying leave it out, he doesn't mean not build culinary. He meant, is it going to be included in what the accelerator building is or is it left freestanding, not leave it out like we're not building. So that's the parts that we're having conversations about. This is where we're um, com um, bringing in the feasibility information to confirm items like that. So getting feedback from our faculty, staff, and students, as well as um, getting the information, updated information about, like we talked about demographics, et cetera, et cetera, to see what should we do in conversations like that? I think that if you look at um, the proposed uh, phase one that was in the presentation, the easiest way to look at it is that phase one is the southern half of the plans. The details are primarily what goes inside the building and how much space is allotted to each program versus like not building a building or um, greatly changing the configuration of a building in terms of its footprint. That makes more sense to you? That, uh, you know, I think clarify? that helps a lot of people. Thank okay. you very, very much. Um, but so what was presented in those schematics to um, a lot of the residents through this long several year process will still likely happen? Is that what I'm hearing? That the, is what the we're using buildings. as the, yeah, the physical, that is what we're, I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. The, the planning that was that was pr done prior is what we're using moving forward. What we're all we're trying to say is that we are making sure that we're not just taking those plans and saying, OK, everything is the same. We're going to move forward. We're saying we're looking at it step by step and making sure also that all of our internal stakeholders also have um, access to give um, direct input on the spaces that they're going to be expected to use. And what we were hearing is that there were gaps in those conversations to some degree. So the urban form that's been presented, paid for, um, you presented tonight, is that going to be what we're going to see when, when build-out happens? I'm sorry, urban form? Uh, the, um, the buildings, what they look like, the architecture, the site plan. Um, that has been presented and worked on. Programming is different, and I understand the feasibility for programming. Is that what we're going to see in the city? That I'm just curious. Well, I, I, let me, if I can. Uh, the schematics that you saw were never complete, and they've never been presented to the board for approval. So, matter of fact, we were in discussions when we uh, did the pause. We were in discussion with the architect that they need to work on the architecture because some of the stuff, I mean, they were pretty pictures, but some of the stuff doesn't work. And so we have to continue through that process. That's why I said we're about 30% done now. We got to get to 100%. And then when we get there, then you'll be able to see what it's going to be. Okay, great. Thank you. I think that clarifies it. And I just hope we're involved. Thank yeah. you very much. Right. Uh, one of the comments that was made was that you are uh, in conversations with uh, Marriott uh, and the Hilton as potential partners uh, for the uh, uh, learning hotel. Uh, does Can I interpret that to mean that you have a commitment to the learning hotel? 
Uh, Dr. Garcia? We're definitely exploring uh, the options available to obviously reiterate that there's a commitment. Um, we are. We're, we're committed and we're going to try to find a way to make this happen. Obviously, I'm appreciative of the tremendous interest and the expression of support and look forward to working with uh, potential future partners in this endeavor. Was I'm not sure I heard a yes there. I, I, I think so I yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes, we're going to, obviously we're committed. Uh, we have to find a way to do, be able to do this uh, in a legal manner and uh, looking forward to working with our partners. Thank you. I'm sorry, Council Member Woods, no, did I, I step on? <laughs> okay. Right. Oh, sorry, my mic was up. Okay. <laughs> Is there any further questions or comments from Council? Uh, Dr. Garcia, Chair Perez, anything further that you would like to say? Well, I, I would just like to thank uh, the City Council for allowing us to be here tonight. The members of the uh, Palm Springs community, the greater Palm Springs community, thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. We're looking forward to working with you. We are committed to making this project come to fruition in Palm Springs. All right. Thank you for coming, and uh, I hope we have made progress. I think we have. Uh, let's get back to work. Thank you, Mayor Milton. Thank you, council members. So uh, with that, we have concluded the conversation that uh, was planned this evening around the College of the Desert. It's uh, 8 o'clock. We've been sitting here for about two and a half hours. Let's take a 10-minute break. When we resume, for those of you who are in the public, we will resume with the normal uh, agendas go, uh, moving back to public uh, to acceptance of the agenda and then to uh, public comment on uh, items not related to COD but on the agenda. Thank you.
All right. Uh, thank you. We uh, will reconvene the uh, uh, city council meeting. The next uh, item is uh, presentations, which we have none this evening. We will now move on to acceptance of the agenda. Our item is acceptance of the agenda. The city council will discuss the order of the agenda may amend the order, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items or request consent calendar items be removed for a separate discussion. I would like to entertain a motion to accept the agenda. Are there any items that staff or a council member would like removed from the consent calendar? And I believe that staff has asked that 1H be removed for a discussion at a later date. That's right. We're asking to remove that from the agenda entirely to come back at a future date. Okay. 1H, One One that's a contract for the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Are there any other items that City Council would like removed from consent? Yes, um, Council. Uh, um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, item 1B, as in boy. One. I should say Bilardo or something. 1B local. is in Bilardo. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Anything else? Councilmember Halstead. Thank you. I just need to note a recusal for the record on item 1K because of a financial interest. All right. Any others? Then uh, we will ask for a motion to approve the agenda with item 1H removed, 1B removed for separate discussion. And note that Councilmember Holstage is recusing herself from 1K. Motion to approve. There's a motion and a second. Here we go. Okay. And the votes approved. All right. We will now move on to public testimony on non-public hearing agenda items only. Uh, we do, if, as I understand it, have two public comments on item 3D. Once we have heard uh, those uh, two public comments, we are going to jump ahead to the Plaza Theater uh, discussion. Kathy Warmick, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Hi, my name is Kathy, is Kathy Warmick, and I wanted to comment on two different items. One second. It's a little difficult for me to get up and mute the um, my, my computer. Oh, good, I've got it. Okay. Uh, two items. I wanted to comment on the housing contract uh, and just a few items that are missing. We really need nexus studies and we need an inclusionary housing program. If we're approving a contract for a housing uh, a housing consultant, uh, we need those two items to really develop a robust affordable housing program in Palm Springs. I do hope the council will take that into consideration when you review those items. Uh, the, the other item I wanted to comment on was the general plan update. Um, in the general plan update, the comments that we in the Planning Commission received the most of were comments about open space. I think in terms of public comments, they were probably about 100 to 1 in, in uh, coming in on preserving various open space items. Uh, there are two items that were discussed, whether or not boulders and crescendo and palm hills uh, should be included, uh, and we should be looking at them for arena numbers. We absolutely should not. Those those serve the community right now as open space. Uh, Planning Commission didn't take action 
on classifications of those because we thought that was a city council purview. Uh, but we can find, you know, if if those those three properties are converted to open space, we can find ways of meeting the state's requirements uh, in terms of um, replacing lost potential housing units in other locations. And that really should be done. We should not, we should not be looking at those parcels uh, in terms of our arena numbers and our overall allocations. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to comment on these two items and sorry for the brief lapse in the beginning of my comments. Thank you. Jane Garrison, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. This is Jane Garrison with Oswit Land Trust. We wanted to be very respectful of your time tonight, knowing how full the agenda is. So we actually ask people not to speak. And I am speaking on behalf of hundreds of residents who have sent you letters regarding boulders and crescendo. And as Kathy Wormick mentioned, before your last vision session, you received over 200 letters asking that boulders and crescendo be conserved as open space. And the most number of comments with the update to the general path plan were from residents, again, asking about open space and specifically boulders and crescendo. Tonight, we are requesting that boulders and crescendo be designated as open space and definitely not upzoned and counted in the arena numbers. When the Planning Commission had one of its original meetings regarding the general plan, land use and housing element, Planning Commissioner specifically asked Flynn if boulders and crescendo could be rezoned as open space, and he stated, I quote, that boulders and crescendo was not included in the housing numbers, and they could designate them as open space because it meets the no net loss provisions of SB 330 from 2018. Now, I know in the past we have asked the city to donate these two properties for conservation, but we are now in a position, thanks to our new grant writer, to work on obtaining grants to purchase these properties from the cities. And if boulders and crescendo is designated as open space, it increases our ability to be successful in obtaining the grants to purchase these properties. So please consider designating them as open space. And we assure you that we will be committed to begin the work on the grants immediately after they are changed to open space. Thank you so much. And I appreciate this time. Madam Mayor, that concludes public comment. All right, thank you. Uh, next item that I would like to move to with the consent of the rest of the council is to uh, engage the discussion uh, with Mr. J.R. Roberts on the Plaza Theater. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, Councilman Kors, did you want to speak first on this, or I'll jump right in. So first of all, I'm very happy to report to you that some projects will start much sooner than 2026, and will be completed much sooner than that. And one of those things will be our very own Plaza Theater. So um, tonight, obviously, you are looking at um, the final contract or donor agreement between our largest donor, uh, David Lee, um, and the city for his great donation of $5 million to the Plaza Theater, which obviously took us light years ahead in our fundraising. Well, I'm very excited to be here tonight to give you some new information. So last week I met with a new donor who would like to remain anonymous right now, but they have decided to give us and pledge $2 million to complete the $2 million matching dollars that were part of the David C. Lee donation. So originally David C. Lee, yes, let's clap for that. David C. Lee had given us $5 million with two of those million being matching funds. We have now fulfilled that. One little caveat, this new donor who we're now referring to as donor two for the time being um, is challenging the city to match his donation. And so 
all I can do at this point is leave that with you. So we have $2 million on the table that we can, that will fulfill one matching, but now challenges us to another $2 million of city matching dollars. I'm also very happy to report that with the help of uh, Councilman Kors, who is a liaison to the uh, Theater Foundation and the mayor, we have been working with the state of California and the state of California is very familiar with us and the theater and uh, is looking at funding a few million dollars as well. So we'll cross our fingers for that. We'll keep working on that. And uh, I don't think I could give you any better news than that tonight. All right. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. If, unless you have any questions, I'll let you get on with your, your evening. Uh, Chair, just uh, one question uh, for the, and mostly for the public. Uh, that rate brings to potentially $7 million in committed funds. What, what's your estimated total budget at this point? Well, you know, we're, we're going after between 10 and $12 million. Mm -hmm. Although I've had the project professionally bid by a local architect that the city has worked with, I'm, I'm sorry, a local contractor that we've worked with a number of times, a number of times, D.W. Johnson, the bids are actually coming in less than the original Gensler projections, but we would still like to continue to, to go ahead and raise 10 to $12 million simply because the worst case scenario is that we leave an endowment behind for the theater. The goal, one of the many goals for the restoration of the theater is that it not tax taxpayers, that it not take taxpayers' dollars, and that it can sustain itself, that it can break even. And if we can leave a nice endowment behind as it needs repairs over the next 80 years of its life, those dollars could be there to do that work. Thank you. That's very, very encouraging. I'm most happy to report that. Thank you all for your help. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great job. With that, uh, and I want to make sure that uh, we do this correctly, uh, we can uh, address a item 3B, which is the gift term sheet in the amount of $5 million for David Lee restoration of the Palm Springs Plaza Theater. Are there any questions or comments from uh, council? Uh, this is an action item. We will need a motion to approve and a second. And let's vote. Councilmember Woods. Item 3B is approved, and let the celebrations get ready to begin. With that, uh, I'd like to move on to the consent calendar. The next item is the consent calendar. I will entertain a motion to accept the count, uh, consent calendar uh, without items 1H removed, 1B uh, rec uh, removed for separate discussion, and recusal of council member Holstage on 1K. Motion in the second. Uh, vote, please. Item 1B, uh, we have removed for separate discussion. Uh, Council Member Woods, you asked for that uh, item removed. Do you want a staff report or is there something you'd, you'd like to comment on? I, I don't think we need a formal staff report. This is a, a request by the Arts Commission for $55,000 to um, create a mural in one of our parking garages. Um, and uh, I have been working um, uh, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic um, with staff on a downtown parking plan and a downtown wayfinding plan for the city of Palm Springs to get people uh, off the streets and into our garages and use our underutilized um, parking spaces. 
part of that plan, which has not been presented to council yet because of COVID concerns and funding concerns, included um, making the entrances to our parking structures the same and consistent throughout the city. Um, so they are looking to paint a parking garage. What I might suggest is that we uh, don't approve it right now, but we ask the Arts Commission to work with um, our staff uh, on the design of some of the parking structure stuff and having an art component as part of it um, at this point. Um, so that it, the, the two will work together. The Art Commission probably has no idea what we were doing. Um, so it's a great recommendation that way, but um, I just don't want the two uh, to be very disparate and then not come together and kind of be a, 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 a misuse, not a misuse, but a, a waste of, of money that we can use better if we jointly work together uh, on making the wayfinding work and maybe adding an art component. So I guess my motion would be to, um, to not approve it at this point, but to direct staff and the Arts Commission to work with staff on our um, overall parking program, which I think a lot of people in the community want. Council Member Woods, it sounds like uh, this can be bifurcated. Uh, and as you know, each of the uh, Public Art Commission requests to use funding must come back to the uh, City Council for approval. Uh, and as indicated in the staff report, any ultimate design will also come back to the City Council for staff approval. Uh, could be separately, so piecemeal, uh, as each project is approved. And uh, your recommendation is a great one. I, I agree with it and, and would uh, bring that to the Public Arts Commission. Uh, but if we could approve the funding for this project, that may prove to be beneficial uh, as we approve and get down the road to approve the actual designs that are going up, which would undergo the regular process of um, permits from the planning department, public hearing through the Public Arts uh, Commission, and final approval by the City Council. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying approve the funding, but we really don't know what the funding's for yet or how much it would be. And that's a concern for me. I think we have to know what we're going to do, get a cost estimate on that, run through our standard procurement process and what that is, and then do it. So I, I'm a little uncomfortable just allocating money um, without having a project to basically allocate it to. Uh, understood. Thank you. Are there any other comments uh, from anyone else on council? Just a uh, question. Uh, as I understand it, the Public Arts Commission wants to move forward with uh, having murals, but has not made a determination as to what those murals are going to look like. That's correct. They have broad themes to include city leadership, mm -hmm. uh, having uh, uh, multicultural, multi-economic status, uh, artists, uh, people from all different types of backgrounds uh, prepare the uh, designs. If we defer uh, action on funding, uh, what does that do in terms of uh, impediments to the uh, Public Arts Commission moving forward with the plans that they want to do? It, it would uh, potentially delay bringing on the project manager for this project, uh, the, who's also the uh, designer, uh, issuing the uh, procurement for that. Uh, and then each of the artists, I think there's about seven artists, up to seven artists, would be paid as their designs are completed. So uh, I think it would just impact the project manager part who would coordinate and organize uh, bringing this uh, proposed project to uh, okay. fruition. Is, uh, is there concern, Council Member Woods, that we should not do this project or just uh, procedural issues around uh, uh, what it is that uh, we're specifically approving and wanting to see the actual uh, recommended art before funding it? 
I think there's uh, there's two questions. One is we're doing the wayfinding, which is painting. You know, the, the initial concept was to paint these um, the entrances uh, to the garages. Um, I don't know what they've proposed. It's nothing is in in the packet. We have no idea what's being proposed. Um, but th that I, I agree that you know we could have some art component in it. I just we don't know what it is and so, or what it's going to cost. I like the idea from the Arts Commission. I love the idea of art um, at that, but I just think it really needs to be integrated better and just needs some time. It just needs some time to flesh out. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> Did I answer the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there a second to uh, Council Member Woods? Uh, yes. Um, so I look at, at the budget, so what is, what is the budget that needs to be spent before we would see a design? I think it's the $5,000 for creative direction. Okay. okay, that's helpful. And thinking on the fly, but uh, I do appreciate, uh, you know, just in thinking about um, wayfinding, right, and some op options we may have there and entrances that can almost tie into the mural, right, with notable people from Palm Springs and be coordinated is, would be great. So what would be needed um, to do that, right? So we don't have this move forward with the design that's very different than wayfinding design and make sure we're taught, right? I'm fine with this going forward as long as we're coordinating them, I guess. If I might just offer, I think one of the potential challenges is just going to be timing. So in reviewing our kind of strategic plan and work plans, we don't have any imminent timing to return to parking wayfinding. And as I understand it, the parking wayfinding is also kind of a broader component of parking management. That was one of the things during visioning that we did identify that we need to circle back on. We just haven't identified the timing of that yet. So I think the coordination that would really work would be for the Arts Commission to work hand in hand with a consultant that's doing that wayfinding so that if, for instance, there is meant to be a, an aesthetic entrance that helps people identify this is a parking structure in Palm Springs and that it's consistent between um, some of our facilities, it might even be a potential expansion of this program to include more than this one garage, but it would also probably be a delay of the program until such time that we could really do that coordination, um, which again is just not scheduled presently, so that it might just mean waiting until we return to that initiative and having the collaboration at that point, which would probably um, negate the need for artistic direction at this point if the goal was to have them truly integrated. Otherwise, I think what you'd be doing if you proceed now would be um, hoping that the wayfinding can work around what is already done versus coordinating it uh, together up front. Although that's not currently scheduled on our next couple agendas, um, from the vision session, is that something we think we're doing in the next six months? Um, it, it didn't come across that quickly. It was okay. one of those items kind of at, on our list that we acknowledged that we need to find time to get back to, um, but, but wasn't planned uh, for the next four months or beyond. Uh, can I ask? Yeah. So, um, the, uh, <clears throat> way, wayfinding can be artful, right? <laughs> it doesn't need to be um, um, pedestrian or, 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 or utilitarian. So I'm wondering if, um, if art money, um, if we can explore um, using art money to kind of jumpstart it um, in a way, um, not only in this location, but in a few others, and just kind of tweak kind of what they are presenting a little bit, um, and uh, talking to our staff that's worked with our consultant to see if that would work. Um, because it may be a funding source that we don't have to hire consultants or to hire artists or hire painters that's not on, and it would not take necessarily staff time to do that, um, except for some coordination work. Is that a fair assessment? It's difficult for me to say without understanding the scope of wayfinding. Sometimes wayfinding is pretty limited to just something like public parking, and at least my limited experience with it is there is a nice blending of kind of artistic design, but enough of the common elements that tell people that aren't familiar with the community that this is directing me to parking, right? So, so it incorporates things like a large P, right, that we're used to seeing in communities. Um, 
some wayfinding initiatives go beyond that and borrow elements of aesthetic that can be used to identify major facilities and um, directions to areas of town and other things. So I really think it probably depends on the scope. One way or the other, I think we'd be wanting to pull in that consultant and whether that work has begun and needs to be extended to completion or whether it requires bringing on a new consultant. One way or the other, we'd have to engage that consultant in the rest of that effort, which really does involve kind of every, you know, not knowing exactly what was done at the conceptual level in, the, in this pr uh, preliminary study, um, identifying the facilities, you know, making some selections of art. There's usually a little bit of a public process or at least some engagement with council on that because anytime you're really talking about, you know, that, that broad plan to identify landmarks, even if it's just parking, it's generally not just done off to the side, right? It, it includes some stakeholder outreach, um, some artistic review, so to speak. So I do think it would take at least a, a decent effort with staff to kind of combine the consultant aspect and the artistic aspect. Um, I don't know that we could completely uh, alleviate the staff burden. There's really no rush for this, I mean, that I'm aware of. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not like it's, we have to spend the money by a certain time or have it designed by a certain time. So we've got time, um, at least in my estimation. Yeah, council member, I would just add, um, we probably need to take a look at the uh, um, municipal code on the allowable uses of public art funds. I know it prevents public art funds from being used for functional furniture for private development. So I don't know where that fits with parking signage. And on the parking signage sign, I'm sure there's certain standards that the signage has to meet that... Um, uh, you know, would somehow have to be incorporated into the uh, public artwork. So I, I think we do need to, uh, if we're going to go down that path, uh, we would need to regroup with the Public Arts Commission for uh, how to address that. Would perhaps it be appropriate to ask the Public Arts Commission to flesh out a bit uh, what their uh, plans are for uh, the artists and uh, in the scope so that we would have just uh, uh, a preliminary understanding of what the art might be looking like and be able to uh, revisit it that way. Um, I think that makes sense and maybe also let them know that we are working on wayfinding and if there's a way, you know, whether it's tying in colors, tying in themes, um, it seems like a great opportunity to make it a really unique, pot, like, unique Palm Springs experience to go into a parking garage uh, with the work that the Art Commission is doing and to tie that together would be a really cool feature, I think. Could you? I'll withdraw my motion. And Such a general direction. <laughs> right, just try right. go ahead. Okay. So do we need a motion or is you have general direction? I think general direction to re-engage the Arts Commission, make sure they're aware that there is a wayfinding initiative and see what other ideas they might have in integrating those efforts is, is what I've heard. So if, if that's correct, we don't need anything further. All right. You can. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. I, uh, really, I just want to say I really appreciate the work of the Arts Commission. I know we all do and really support this work. Um, and. Um, thank them for that. Um, and I just wanted to comment overall, this is a lot of money to invest um, in the parking structure, and I appreciate that it should, you know, we should think about how it can be practical. And I just wanted to comment um, that I am looking forward to kind of a strategic conversation with the Arts Commission about um, where we should put art in Palm Springs. I know we've invested a lot of public art in exactly that block. Um, and looking at the photos, I mean, obviously that's a concrete jungle there and would really use... Um, benefit from a mural, um, but also thinking through that we have like DeMuth Community Center, which I would love to see a mural on, or other, you know, city buildings or other areas of town that really haven't seen the benefit of public art. Um, and so just thinking through, like, what is that large-scale plan for public art throughout that block of downtown? You know, where else do we need it? And coming together on a strategic way. And I, I personally hate to hold up the Arts Commission because I've always kind of fought um, the city council having a ton of oversight because then I think no public art gets approved and then we delay forever 
um, and it's just a longer process. So I think as we, um, you know, make sure that these projects go forward um, with appropriate, like, strategic planning and oversight. Um, but I appreciate the comments, and um, I'm generally supportive of that, um, as long as it doesn't, you know, prevent a mural from getting done, you know, because we could work for a very long time on wayfinding and design, and those things t tend to take a long time in Palm Springs. So I would agree with that. I think a little strategy or a meeting with them would be really great. Um, I personally think murals are problematic in many ways, um, unlike other types of art, in that the maintenance of them, we saw that with um, the Unity Center, you know, where it fades terribly, and then we have to put up heavy tiles, and does the wall support the tiles? Paint fades out here. Blue and purple is terrible. Um, and it's a long-term cost for the city, different than polishing a sculpture or some other form of art. So you know we need you know there's there's cost involved in that, and um, and as we build out the city, you know the art fund, um, you know, is, will become less, and so we will take on a burden of that, and then people become attached to these murals. Right, and they want the original artist to touch them up, and it's, it, it ends up being a very difficult thing to do. So I just, as we as we move forward in the strategic, I agree with um, Council Member Holstage. I just want to be um, full breathed about it. I guess. We have thank the you. direction. Okay, thank you. Then our <clears throat> next item are is public hearings. The next portion of the agenda is public hearings. Due to the nature of the items 2A and 2B, we will be conducting these hearings simultaneously. This is a public hearing to consider an appeal by Eric Kurt of Carmenita Properties concerning Planning Commission's decision to deny the applications concerning the properties located at 310 and 322 West Crestview Drive. Uh, First, I'd like to ask uh, the city clerk, how many uh, individuals do we have uh, wanting to speak on this? Five. Five total, the total. applicant and four others. Yes. Since we have these items to, uh, together, uh, I'd like to give the applicant uh, seven and a half minutes instead of the traditional five to uh, make their presentation. And we will also, uh, particularly with the council representing, the neighbors uh, give that council uh, an additional two minutes to make their presentation. Uh, and to all of the other speakers, we will give you some additional discretion, but ask that you stay as close to two minutes as you can. With that, uh, staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, hopefully you can hear me tonight, better than the last time. Uh, the matter before you are two appeals for major architectural applications mm -hmm. and administrative minor modifications for two hillside residences located at 310 and 322 West Crestview Drive. The project proponent is, has submitted the appeals requesting the council overturn the decision of the Planning Commission to deny these applications, which occurred on February 23rd of this year. The homes consist of a 2,775 square foot house, 503 square foot garage at 310 West Crestview, and the other lot is 2,800 square feet in size with a 533 square foot garage at 322 West Crestview Drive. In terms of the review process, these applications were submitted to the city prior to uh, the update of the architectural review ordinance that was established last year. So they were submitted prior to the April changes that were made and the uh, authority of the ARC having ability to approve our hillside homes. Uh, so these were processed under the prior review process, including the condition, including the findings that are necessary um, for approval, which were the old findings that were being considered. So the matter was reviewed by the Architectural uh, Advisory Committee, 
and that was back in June and July of last year, at which time they continued the matter at both of those meetings for design revisions. Uh, they ultimately, at their third review, recommended approval of the homes, both homes, um, on August 30th of 2021. The Planning Commission considered the matter back in December, uh, on December 8th, and directed the applicant to install story poles and provide additional renderings, um, including corrections to the renderings that were necessary for Planning Commission review. The commission reviewed the story poles and requested that they provide certification of the poles that were installed, as well as add a uh, string and ribbon to show the massing of the proposed buildings on the lots. And again, revise renderings and update landscape plans. Um, those should be provided to the commission for review. So ultimately the commission reviewed, uh, after all that occurred, the project on February 23rd and denied the project, as I mentioned. Uh, the vote was four to one uh, for a denial for both applications. Uh, so just to give you a bit of context, the project is located on Crestview Drive on the north side of Crestview Drive. These are infill lots between existing homes in the neighborhood. Uh, there are, uh, you can see here, the two lots highlighted surrounded by red dashed lines. Uh, the first home, 310 West Crestview, uh, as I mentioned, this is the home on the, the east side of the two. And uh, it, you can see on the left the varying terrain and topography uh, that exists on that lot. Uh, and you can see it's, it's, there's quite a bit of variation in the terrain. Um, as I mentioned, it's about a 27, 2800 square foot house. The uh, total footprint is 3278 square feet and has a lot coverage of roughly 21.6%. Uh, and the building height for this home is proposed at 23.6 feet. Uh, it is a single story residence. Uh, and as I'll get into in a moment, the other property or other project is a two story residence. Um, and so they do require a minor modification, which is permissible for hillside lots to modify the building envelope, which is, um, you know, is typically used when it's difficult to uh, a pro or propose a home that conforms to the um, set standards for height limits in R1 districts. So typically it's 12 feet at your setbacks and as you approach the center of the lot you're allowed to rise to 18 feet. Um, so that, that's permissible for hillside lots. So the elevations here you can see the front elevation which faces the street uh, at the top of the screen and then the east elevation or if you're looking at the home from the street is the right side on the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can see, that, as you probably recall in the, ter the topography exhibit, that the terrain is really the, at the center of the lot where it's kind of higher and then it drops off uh, towards the rear and a portion towards the southeast of the lot. Uh, so the highest point at which the building is tallest is at the rear of the, the property where you have a 23.6 foot height from that grade. On the west side of the lot, you see the, top, the, uh, the elevation here on the top of the screen, and then the rear elevation is located on the bottom of the screen. Again, the, the highest points are the rear of the home. Uh, and then they have shown uh, renderings of the proposed house. On the left, you see what it would appear at, uh, as from the street. And on the right side, you see what the home would look like from the rear portion of the lot or at the street behind it. Moving on to the other property, uh, 322 West Crestview, which is parcel five on the left side of the screen. You see the terrain again is uh, quite significant um, towards the, as it drops back towards the rear of the lot with the higher portion towards the front. And then here are the metrics for this property. It's an 11,000 square foot lot. They are proposing a, a two-story design with uh, the upper area as roughly on just under 1,800 square feet, the lower area about 1,000 square feet and a 533 square foot garage. The building height for this one is 25.8 feet when measured from the lowest to highest point of the structure. Uh, so it does require the minor modification application. 
to modify the billing envelope as well as um, the front setback at 10 feet. So these are the elevations, front elevation on the top, and then the east elevation or the right side of the home, if looking at it from the street, is on the bottom, uh, showing the height of the home, at, again, the highest point being at the rear of the structure, 25.8 feet. Uh, and then the west elevation and the rear elevations of the home, this is where you see probably the, most significantly the, the two-story component of the residence as the lot drops off towards the rear. And so when you're looking at it in comparison uh, next to each other, this gives you a sense of the context between the two structures, the rear elevation, um, what is kind of seen from the rear arroyo that exists towards the back of the lots. Uh, and they've provided these renderings to show how the homes are proposed within the context of the existing topography and neighborhood. So going back to the decision of the Planning Commission on February 23rd, the application was denied by a vote of four to one. The commission was able, unable to make three findings relative to the architectural review criteria uh, the, in terms of the location of the structures in relationship to the open space and topography. Uh, the commission did not find that the homes were uh, compatible with the other homes in the, uh, the canyon area there, the, uh, back up to the Arroyo. They didn't feel that the homes were, had harmonious relationship with the adjoining developments or neighborhood. And then they didn't um, believe that the maximum height and overall mass were um, compatible. So the three findings that they made uh, in the negative for the architectural review application were those three of, the, of those required. And then again, the minor modification application, they were unable to make findings relative to criteria one and two. Um, other issues that have been raised throughout this process are relative to um, the project impacting areas of slope that exceed 30 uh, percent. There is no strict prohibition of um, building a structure on a portion of a lot that does have a 30 percent slope of a uh, 30 percent or more slope. But uh, there is language that is in the city's hillside ordinance that says you can't subdivide uh, those areas or those areas that are are exceeding 30% slope should be excluded from um, the proposed subdivision. This is an existing lot of record, or these are existing lots of record, so this was an established neighborhood um, several decades ago. And so that was obviously not taken into consideration when the neighborhood was established. Um, so there is a specific uh, general language, I should say there's more general language in the general plan about protecting hillsides and slope areas. Uh, but uh, in general terms, that's more relative to areas that are above the toe of slope in the hillside and mountain areas. Uh, number, in terms of the number of applications being considered, the city does have two applications that were submitted for these lots. So that's um, all that has been considered by staff when reviewing um, the proposal as it relates to CEQA and the California Environmental Quality Act. And relative to impacts on wildlife flooding and hydrology, uh, the properties are not located within the Coachella Valley multi-species habitat conservation um, protected areas relative to the bighorn sheep. Uh, that's actually further west, um, more in the mountainous areas. Uh, and that's what's identified in the MSHCP plan. Uh, in terms of flooding and hydrology, the city's engineer has reviewed the preliminary hydrology plan uh, there were comments during the review process that, that the document had not been finalized, but um, we do have a, uh, we have gotten to the point where the document is technically correct and um, approved by our city engineer. So they've reviewed all of those issues and don't see uh, hydrology as a problem for the project. So tonight, the uh, matter uh, before you is to open the appeal hearing and consider testimony and adopt the resolution either upholding the Planning Commission's decision and denying the applications or as an alternative, staff also has the, uh, the resolutions that were presented to the Planning Commission when we made our recommendation for approval. And so with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you very much, available for questions. Questions for uh, Mr. Newell? 
Councilmember Woods. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, just a couple of quick, quick questions. Um, the, you talked about the hydrology, and I just I want to repeat that the hydrology is not a problem um, um, according to our staff on this. Is that correct? That's correct. The and city then, engineer has reviewed the hydrology plan several, on several occasions, and they've found it in accordance with their um, requirements. Right. And then, uh, you know, we got communications, by the way, uh, just to the public. I read all the communications. There was quite a few of them. Thank you. Um, but the multi-species habitat conservation plan, we had a letter on that, and you touched base on it, but that doesn't apply here because this is already considered land that you can build on to preserve land up um, in environmentally sensitive areas. Is that correct? That's correct. So the multi-species habitat conservation plan does not come into play here? It would not. Okay, great. And then the other thing is because of the size of the building, well, let me back up and just preface it. We, you know, by state law, you can build a second unit um, by right on your property with very minimal review. Is that correct? Correct. Right. So these properties are being built out in such a way that it's almost impossible for anyone to add an ADU. If they were to build a smaller building, they could actually add an ADU at some future date without going through planning commission or city council. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. So um, they could, in essence, build out the lot to what they're trying to build right now with an ADU if they got a smaller building, if, we, if, if it was just recent. So the other question I was going to ask is, do we as a city council, if we were to um, uh, uh, overturn the planning commission decision, do we need to make findings or are those in the um, resolutions that is attached? Yes, the so staff has presented two resolutions. One is a, a resolution if the c council chooses to approve the applications, and then the other is the findings that the commission made. So the council could adopt either resolution. And, and, and thank you, Mr. Noel. The last question I have is um, on the slope of, and I went to the sites to look at them, um, so I was very familiar with it, or I could be more familiar with it. And the, um, there's nothing, the, um, the building itself is not cantilevered over the um, slope, is it? I was trying to figure that out through the renderings. Yeah, it does project out um, because it does extend where the slope, the natural slope does um, you know, drop down. So it does extend out, but the structure generally is all the way to the ground. To the ground. So fire doesn't come up underneath and burn the floor up. I think, you know, I think um, some there, commute, yeah, right? There okay. Be, yeah, there may be um, piers, but, uh, but no, it wouldn't have an opening that, you know, people could crawl under. Right, okay. Well, I think it's more about, the, I think Los Angeles and several counties, you know, when you have them cantilever on a hillside, the fire that comes up burns the houses almost like a match. So thank you very much. Other questions for staff? Uh, Mr. Newell, uh, the, uh, as I understand it with the staff report, uh, the height and the setback uh, do not conform on either property. Is that correct? And they don't conform to the strict requirements of an R1 lot. Uh, typically, R1 lots have a 25-foot setback, so uh, they have submitted the minor modification requests for hillside right. lots, which is, which is not unusual, I should say. So uh, if they were to strictly follow, what would that uh, entail in terms of how the property would be oriented? If they were to comply with the front yard setback, they would, it would push the structure further back and more likely down into the canyon. And the difficulty with that then becomes how you're dealing with hydrology and then accessing the, okay. the structure. Uh, now that uh, affects the setback if we don't approve that, but the height, uh, is that affected by uh, it? Because it's as I saw the properties, and Anna, I as well did go uh, out to uh, inspect the property on multiple occasions. And I will note for the record that I also, on one of those visits, uh, met with some of the uh, neighbors of the property. Uh, but it, uh, in that uh, location in the corner where it was uh, a 23-foot height, as I recall it, there is a cantilever under there. Is, is that correct? Uh, so the, the single-story structure does extend out slightly, yes. All right. And so that 26 or 23-foot 
uh, drop exceeds what is a strict uh, conformity with that. Uh, all right. Correct. And on the other property, is there also any cantilevering? Um, no, instead they've stacked the mm -hmm. lower floor with the higher mm -hmm. floor. But yet it still gets to be uh, higher than what is strictly permitted. Is that correct? Correct. All right, All right. thank you. Any questions for Mr. Newell before we move on to the applicant and to uh, public comment? All right, with that, uh, uh, I'll ask the city clerk to please reach out to the applicant. And again, we will provide the applicant seven and a half minutes. Because we're bringing both of these items together, we're giving a little bit of discretion to both the applicant and to other public commentators. Good evening. I am Eric Crutt, one of the owners of this property. This denial was a miscarriage of justice and procedure. This application has been in the works for over two years and has been in plan review for over 14 months. These are merely two single family lots that have been platted, developed, and overlooked for decades. At this point, we have met all the criteria for an approval. These plans are the result of our responses to the year long recommendations and requests by the planning department and the AAC for which we received a unanimous approval, but conflicting direction from the Planning Commission. I am aware how disruptive new construction can be to an established neighborhood and its historic enjoyment of vacant lots. However, this does not alter their inherent viability. I feel, as others do, that the Planning Commission was reacting to the most vocal opposition and their erroneous, distractive legal claims, the most recent of which is that we are developing a five-lot subdivision in a piecemeal process. We are not, and we have no intention of building on all five. We are a small operation and originally only wanted these two lots, but had no choice as the seller would only agree to sell the group. Now our architect, Eric Hawkins of Hawkins Marshall, will explain the technical basis of this appeal. Thank you for your time and opportunity to, to present to you today. Um, part of my presentation I'm going to speed through in, in respect of time here. but. Uh, we're asking that you to overturn the decision by the Planning Commission to deny these two proposed projects on the grounds that they are actually, in fact, consistent with the general plan. Uh, the general plan is quite clear on the roles and responsibilities of the Architectural Advisory Committee in reviewing the conformance of, uh, with the general plan. And despite the AAC deeming both of these projects as in conformance, uh, the Planning Commission, or sorry, the, the Planning Commission disagreed, which is well within their right. However, at that point, the Planning Commission should then be held to the highest standard in upholding the general plan. Um, and as I've called out in these two slides, the general plan is quite specific in um, what they deem the highest priority for, for Palm Springs, one of those being the diversity and uh, uniqueness of architectural character within the neighborhood. Furthermore, in the, the community design element, goes on to list a number of design objectives which will offer the guidance to the city leaders, architects, and residents. Uh, and among those are, and I quote, to retain architectural quality, diversity, and eclecticism, which is essential to the charm and character of Palm Springs. Um, I bring this up because the, the Planning con Commission focuses specifically on one aspect of, of the design elements um, and ignores this portion of the general plan. And it focuses on the fact that our uh, neighborhood, uh, or, or our approach to design does not um, conform and does not match exactly the historic neighborhood development pattern. So in the first objection, um, they focus specifically on the fact that we project into the hillside beyond the neighboring lots along the rim of the canyon. Um, we went through this with the AAC and worked tirelessly with them to try to come up with a proposal that was much less, um, resulting in a reduced projection of around 16 feet than what we originally submitted, which is shown there in the blue dashed lines. Um, these projects were unanimously uh, recommended for approval by the, the AAC at that time. Um, furthermore, when uh, it talks about us projecting beyond further than the neighboring lots, 
it specifically focuses on five existing houses, uh, despite the fact that the general plan asked them to look at the whole neighborhood level. Um, of those five lots or existing houses, only two of those lots have any similarity of, of context with our site, um, both in size and terrain. Of those two, you'll see here, we only project about four to 11 feet uh, beyond their existing developments. So despite the fact that the Planning Commission says we extend far beyond the existing neighborhood developments, we in fact don't. Uh, that is also a, a finding that the planning staff recommended approval on. Uh, furthermore, the second objection was the harmonious relationship. Um, again, it focuses on that same issue of extending over the hillside not being consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. You can see all those gray houses, uh, that forms the neighborhood and they're focusing on just the blue and yellow ones. Um, and again, only those two, the, the two and three lots right next to ours are the ones that are even remotely similar in terms of context. Uh, so the, uh, despite the fact that the planning staff uh, very clearly informed the commission about the uniqueness and diversity of the, um, that exists in the neighborhood, uh, the planning commission uh, did not agree. Um, and so I wanna show you an example of the diversity within the neighborhood. Um, so you can see both differences in massing and architectural uh, character. Two story, single story, it all exists in this neighborhood. They said um, that our project being diverse as it is, does not fit within this neighborhood. I want you guys to be the judge of the diversity that exists currently in the neighborhood and the fact that ours only strengthens that character. Furthermore, the, th the third objection is broken into to three, kind of three parts. Um, the first is that the massing of the proposed residences are greater than um, the other residences in, in the neighborhood. And very clearly did the planning staff say that uh, in their recommendation for approval that our house is actually smaller than the average of the neighborhood that the neighborhood houses range from 1950 to 7,749 square feet, resulting in an average of 3,465 square feet, while ours remain at 3,278 square feet and 3,344 respectively. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of quickly move on to the second point, second and third point, which is the, the request for the minor modifications. And the earlier question about the front setback issue we were actually advised by the Architectural Advisory Committee to pursue that minor modification because it is so consistent with the neighborhood. If you go up this street, and I'm showing you photos right here, all of these houses along this street next to ours are currently um, less than the required 25 feet. So all of these homes, if they were to ask for a permit right now, would need the minor modification. Um, and lastly, because I have 24 seconds here, um, to discuss quickly about the maximum height, um, the planning staff calls out the fact that we are very low with an average of 10, foot, 10 and a half feet to 13 and a half feet at the street level of Crestview. So if you look at that section diagram there, we maintain the view sheds of the neighbors behind us. Um, and it's only at the steepest part of the descending slope that we uh, exceed what's um, allowable and ask for the minor modification. Thank you for your time. I apologize for going over. I'm sorry? Be able to complete your presentation? Um, very close. All right. Thank I'm you. available for questions. If you All right. Can. Thank you. Are there are questions for, well, we should go on to uh, the public comments. Yes. Jim Dunn. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, my name is Jim Dunn, and I live on Ridge Road. Um, I've been asked to comment on behalf of some of my neighbors who couldn't be here tonight. Um, essentially, we're asking for one thing, that you uphold the decision of the Planning Commission and deny the um, appeal. 
Having spent hours attending every meeting associated with this project, we can assure you that this project, or at least a portion that is uh, before you tonight, has been get, given every opportunity to succeed. Um, there were three meetings with the AAC. Normally there are two. Um, at the second meeting, it was about to be denied. Um, and then the, the committee gave them one more chance to come back. Um, when asked what they should do, the answer was do what we told you to do <laughs> the first two meetings. So they've had the opportunity to do that. Then it went through three planning commission meetings. So we've spent probably at least 12 hours on meetings. Um, you're getting roughly 20 minutes, if that. Um, so we would support the planning commission. Um, the issues that were there in the beginning still exist today. Um, the issues that we see first is the phase um, of a spec house subdivision. Basically, <laughs> I know Eric said that they're only doing um, two houses. He stated in the meetings at the AAC that they are doing four, possibly five, um, or offered to do less, I should say. So that's what we're going off of. He owns all five lots. It's logical to presume that that would be the case. Um, the lots, the houses are too large for the lots. Um, that's another issue that we brought up. And also it was noted by the planning commissioners, including the one planning commissioner who voted um, for the project. Um, third, the houses need to follow the contours of the land. This was brought up over and over and over again. It's yet to occur in a complete way. The last comment at the last planning commission was that um, you have these houses with um, that should follow the slope of the land. And if they did that, they should have steps. And he only saw 18 inches drop in this, basically three steps, he said, in a, in a sloping lot in, in these houses. Um, the other thing we would say is the wash and canyon are distinctly different from the rest of the neighborhood. The houses that are on the lot, on the canyon, they're visible on both the front and the back, not just the front of the house, um, as most of our houses are. So these houses are different, and that's something that we brought up over and over again. The diversity in terms of the neighborhood, it's fine to have, you know, all the different types. There's no dispute on the actual design of the house and it, its appearance. What we're talking about is the way that it sits on the lot. The ho house next door is 1,603 square feet. This is almost double that size. The house next door to that is 1,605, double that. The house at the top of those three houses is 2,300. It's a two-story house. Um, but it fits into the envelope and it fits in the lot. So that's what we're asking to happen. And that is what the Planning Commission was trying to convey. So we urge you to um, uphold the planning decision, the Planning Commission's decision, and deny the appeal. Thank you. Kim McNulty. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. Um, my name is Kim McNulty, and my family has lived on Crestview um, since 1962. We actually own two properties there, uh, and so the neighborhood has been home for a long time. We've been here late. You have extensive documentation in your packets, a letter from our neighborhood group, which was signed by 34 of the homeowners in our neighborhood, as well as a letter from uh, an attorney who's representing our interest as well. And it clearly articulates our position. Um, Mr. Dunn just uh, also expressed what he, uh, I think what all of us feel as well. So I won't take up valuable time there um, re-articulating re that, but I would encourage you just to, again, follow the recommendations of the Planning Commission and please deny this. Thank you. Joseph Burke. Good evening, Mayor and Council. You've heard from the uh, quiet speakers in the group. I'm the loud one here. Um, there is extensive information in your packets. Our attorney, especially a land use specialist, laid out extensive problems with the two properties that seem to be 
trying to gloss over or steamrolled over. Um, I really disagree. You saw a fancy dog and pony show with the renderings. The renderings were disingenuous in that they, the, the last two renderings of the houses from the canyon did not show the houses matching the story poles. They've been compressed to look smaller. It, to me, that's just, it's just not, it's rather disingenuous. Um, the developer has shown general disdain for the public, for us, in this process. He did, he owns five lots. He offered a fire sale that he's only going to build on four. It's public record. These houses are cantilevered out. If you look at the plans, you look at the profile, you can see they're on piers. They're cantilevered out in the canyon. In the case of 310, it's cantilevered further than the prow of an oligarch's super yacht. I mean, it sticks out into the canyon. Um, at one meeting, we were called um, politically motivated obstructionists and freeloaders. I moved into my house seven years ago today. I've been paying my mortgage ever since. I assure you, I'm not a freeloader. I'm a concerned citizen. I know my neighbors. We are mostly year-round residents and homeowners, and we care deeply about our neighborhood and the city and the valley in general. I urge you to also respect the unanimous decision of the Planning Commission, almost unanimous decision of the Planning Commission, and deny this appeal. I think that we should pump the brakes on this development. I'm not against development. Can I have a few more seconds to, to finish? We're not against this development, uh, but there is a lot at stake here in terms of the environment, in terms of various regulations and the general plan and uh, the unsuitability. One slide that you didn't see today was this slide from the street that showed the renderings of the houses from the street. They look, they run together. They actually look the same. So you have got two houses on two lots that look like one huge long house. And it's just, I think information has been cherry picked by the uh, developers. I understand they want to do that to look the best they can, but I don't think you've got a true, unless you read Mr. Dunn, our neighborhood letter and our attorney's letter, you won't get the full picture. So I thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, you're doing a great job here. Thanks. Yes. Neil McLennan, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I just want to be very quick. I, I live at 400 Ridge Road, which is the parallel road to um, Crestview, where these developments are. I, our lawyers uh, set out a bunch of issues that are we are all in support of, as have my neighbors. I just want to talk about two things about uh, when I look at this, the concept of fairness. And one, I want to talk about the legal concept, which I don't understand about, but I just want to give some context to the idea of Procedural fairness, you know, I, I, for the first time in my life, I've come to planning commission meetings. You know, there were two planning commission meetings. There were three architecture review meetings. We were hours and hours and hours of evidence and questions back and forth. So while I appreciate the applicant does not like the result, there can't be any doubt that this was procedurally fair. Everybody had a chance to talk and go back and forth. And I, I'm heartened to see the members of the planning commission, including uh, uh, Commissioner Roberts, who voted against us, are engaged in other things. They're super engaged people. So that's one on the, the legal side. But on the practical side, I just want to mention about the concept of, of fairness. And it really uh, came home when, when Mr. Krupp said these lots have been overlooked for decades. It's not true. They've been overlooked for almost a century. These lots are in the oldest part of the oldest neighborhood in Palm Springs. And at a certain juncture, someone wonders why they have not been built on. And the reason they haven't been built on is because you can't do it in a reasonable, integrative way without being unbelievably oppressive onto the environment. That's just simply the case. That's why these lots have not been built upon. Uh, and I feel even tonight, the applicant doesn't understand that. They say, we've met all the requirements. Well, but they have not. They want to be higher. They want to be closer. And they want to do all the things that prevented these lots from being sold for 80 to 90 years because it's too obtrusive to build on them. Um, there are ways to do it, but there's not ways for a developer to do it to make the maximum amount of money by putting 
the largest buildings possible. I just don't think that's uh, the way these lots work out. And that's just the more common uh, aspect of, of fairness. So I don't think they meet all the requirements. I know that's their position every time they show up. But they're asking for, for relaxations. I just don't think it's fair. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Bye. Beverly Grossman Palmer, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Mesa Neighborhood Organization. Um, and I, as, as people have noted, I submitted written comments uh, supporting the Planning Commission decision. Uh, that decision should be affirmed, the appeal should be denied. The Planning Commission based its determination to deny the project on clear policies in the general plan. And these are also reflected in the Hillside Management Ordinance. The community design element encourages hillside development that respects the natural terrain rather than detracts from it by designing houses that fit the natural contours of the slope. These policies call for sensitive integration of architecture into the existing landform. Uh, these policies apply to any hillside area with a slope greater than 10%. These hillsides actually contain slopes steeper than 30%. And under the hillside ordinance, such areas shouldn't be developed at all. Uh, the applicant says that this design is intended to preserve the hillside by not grading it, but he's obscuring the hillside and building over it, really dominating it rather than building harmoniously with it. The Planning Commission was absolutely correct in denying these requests for departures from code requirements because this project does not sensitively integrate with the hillside. I'd like to turn to CEQA, which the Planning Commission did not really address. CEQA, the Planning Commission uh, uh, require, uh, didn't make CEQA findings at all, but the um, project is not should not be held exempt from CEQA. As, um, as, we've, as some others have discussed, the applicant owns five lots and has stated in public meetings that he would develop at least four of those. This exemption for single family homes applies to the development of no more than three homes. And the courts have instructed to look at the whole of a project. The public record is clear that the whole of the project includes more than these two homes that are before the council tonight. Secondly, unusual circumstances render an exemption inappropriate. And those are that this is located within bighorn sheep habitat. I know that it is not within the multi-species habitat conservation area, but it is an area frequented by bighorn sheep as evidenced by the photos and videos provided by the neighbors of these animals visiting the terrain right around these properties. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has opined that low-lying, the development in low-lying habitat areas is a significant problem for bighorn sheep. And this is something that would be analyzed in a CEQA review. Uh, and secondly, the project is in a mapped floodplain, which is a specific mapped environmental condition that prohibits application of the CEQA exemption. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife commented that the project appears to have the potential to interfere with a water course due to its location on the canyon and stated that it would rely on the city to provide a CEQA document uh, for it to issue any necessary um, lake and stream bed alteration agreements. But there will be none because the city has not conducted any CEQA review. And then finally, on the hydrology, it's, uh, staff says tonight that the applicant had submitted hydrology studies which were approved by the city engineer, but these have not been circulated to the public. These are the kind of, this is the kind of thing that in a proper CEQA review would be included for the public to review and comment on rather than um, happening kind of behind the scenes and where it is not available and subject to public scrutiny. So I thank you for your time. I, I, uh, you should uphold the Planning Commission's decision. It was thoughtful and uh, reflects the city's general plan policies in, uh, in a supportable and appropriate manner. Thank you very much. Madam Mayor, that concludes public comment. All right. Uh, the applicant will be given an opportunity to 
uh, provide rebuttal. Uh, how much time do you need? I'm trying to give you. Earlier, the issues that were brought up related to CEQA, environmental sensitivity, bighorn sheep, those issues have been over and over discussed at all of the hearings and deemed exempt or not applicable um, as one of the main reasons why the Planning Commission didn't mention it in their findings. Um, I did want to mention, however, um, the, again, reinforce the issue that the minor modification request um, is consistent with the neighborhood um, and that the, the height requirement and that the, the design that projects over the hillside is not an attempt to obscure the natural hillside, but it's an attempt to work within both the, the strict uh, building and zoning codes as well as the general plan. So we're doing our best to minimize our impact on the hillside despite what the neighbors decide to say about it. Um, and our approach by putting it on piers and cantilever that number 310 uh, West Crestview is to build respectfully on that slope. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Sit with. Certainly. In your packets, I, I think. Uh, there was uh, several uh, uh, letters of support. We, we, we do have support uh, within the neighborhood. Uh, they are less vocal than the ones in opposition for obvious reasons. Um, they're certainly not as willing to uh, put in writing their opposition and they're uncomfortable uh, publicly opposing their own neighbors for obvious reasons. But uh, they have reached out to us uh, several of them have written letters, which you have. Uh, one of them, notably, is 294 uh, Crestview, which is directly adjacent to uh, 310. Uh, they, we share a property line. Uh, they're downhill, and they live there full time. This is the Sunny Bono Estate. Uh, they've made a substantial investment there, and they're going to continue to do so as they renovate it. Um, and they have no problem with this. They love what we're doing. They uh, um, have suggested that uh, they feel their neighbors are wrong and are intentionally trying to mislead um, the officials that are deciding this matter, and um, they offered their support. Uh, they are arguably the most impacted by this project, and we have their full support. Um, one more thing I want to note, these, this height uh, of these projects has been limited by digging them into the ground. We have buried the first floor of both houses into the ground by three feet to minimize the height impact. Um, it creates an, an odd look from my standpoint in, in, in having to market a home or even purchase one of these houses, having it sit so low in the street. But if you look at the, at the, uh, at the, um, at the street view of these homes, they are noticeably lower than all of the others. Um, and, and this was in efforts uh, by us to respond to all the comments by the neighbors, the planning department, and the AAC. And these plans are a direct result of all these comments. And that's why we had an, an, a unanimous approval by the AAC, and we were absolutely shocked to, to not have that mirrored by the PC. All right. There being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from council? Madam Mayor, if I could ask the first speaker to come back to the microphone very quickly, I'd like to ask you a question if I can. Um, and as you're walking up, I don't want you to reiterate what you just said. I just have a, um, it's on the record and I think we've heard it and it's in the, it's in the, uh, the record. So I think what I heard you say, you're, you wanted a smaller home, is that, but is that what you're looking for? What we're looking for um, is the mass and scale to be consistent or, or more compatible with what's in the neighborhood. So what I was explaining where, for example, when they showed you the, the top-down view of the um, properties and the property next door and said that it comes out four feet, well, it doesn't. It comes 30 feet beyond the house. It comes four feet beyond the next-door neighbor's pool 
But so those are the types of things. When you take a, a 1,600 square foot house, it's a 1,600 square foot house. This is, I believe, 27 or 2,800 um, plus the garage. So, but livable square footage to livable square footage, 1,600 to 2,700. So what we were looking for was mass and scale that are more compatible with those lots because everything else has been built on the pads the flat part of the lots, they didn't generally slope down and contour because they weren't maximizing the space. Understanding that, you know, with a developer, there's a different motivation and a desire to maximize the square footage. So are you opposed to this, the, the reduced setback as an example, or? We, what we're trying to do is get the scale of the project back in. And so the way the only way we've got to work with is the, the 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 requirements from the code okay great thank you very much for coming back up I appreciate it sure. um, David I want to ask you a question if I can I want to ask the applicant the same question uh, so um, you might want to listen up here um, if you were to um, put 25 feet as a setback on this particular lot what kind of, do you know what kind of pad you would have? It seems like you'd have a shack. Um, well, it would change the dynamic in terms of how they address um, hydrology issues because at the back of the lot, there kind of is a natural drainage feature that occurs. Uh, so yeah, it might impact the size of the structure if it is pushed further back. The other thing that uh, comes into play here is uh, within the Mesa neighborhood, many of the streets are offset from the center or the middle, you know, the main kind of the traveling through the middle of the right-of-way area. So a lot of times you see, you know, narrower streets in this neighborhood um, and oftentimes not, you know, within that right-of-way space and sometimes on private property. So it, it, it's not exactly, um, because of the history here, there's, right. everything's not perfectly centered. Great. And could I have the applicant address the same question? Um, if you were to have to move it back 25 feet, what would happen? So we actually presented the AAC with an option that was 25 foot setback on 310. Um, I'm gonna go kind of there. So we had three options. Uh, the first one was if you look at 310, had no encroachment in the front setback. Uh, help, help me out what I'm looking at. Uh, the diagram on the left. Okay, um, thank you. It was deemed too far out into the hillside. We, they said it's really consistent with the neighborhood to be 10, 15 feet uh, from the garage to the property line. So why don't you explore that and bring the whole house back? We did that. And furthermore, we pro proposed a design option that didn't cantilever nearly as much and used the portion of the buildable pad, which you can see in white on these lots. Um, as where we would put the house. So if you look at 310 on, on the second diagram in the middle, it extends into the front setback maybe three, four, five feet. Um, and then only because it was continually uh, advised by the AAC that this is consistent with uh, the street and the neighborhood, both houses then on the third submittal on the right were brought further forward towards the street with the, fifth, with the request for the uh, 15 foot setback, minor modification. Um, and earlier to your question, as or part of the question also talks about what's really buildable. The area in gray, highlighted in gray on these um, topographical underlays, shows the portion of the site that's 30% or greater, which we were told by the engineering department we were not allowed to grade upon. That's why our design looked at the cantilevered option and used piers and not a foundation wall to avoid grading on those areas that were steep. So. If we were to have to build on that small white section on, this, on these two lots, we would have a buildable floor area of, of 900 to 1,000 square feet, something like that. Great. Thank you. That really helps. Thank you very much. Are there other questions, uh, comments for, for council? Council member Coors. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, David. Please tell me the process under our new rules would be quicker. Uh, correct. So under the new um, architecture review process, the ARC has authority to approve hillside homes and AMMs, minor modification applications. Okay. So that wouldn't have gone to the Planning Commission at all? 
Correct. Okay. That's what I thought, and um, that's why we changed the rules, because it's way too long for any project to be getting to us at this stage. Um, that aside, um, and I understand, and I went to the site, and the steepness and those issues. Um, and I don't know if you looked at this analysis, or if this is a city attorney question, or both. Um, but I think, you know, the attorney we heard from, and I read her letter, I've read all, all of this. Um, I'm just a little concerned on the CEQA issue, so I want to make sure I really understand why the process was the way it was and what the analysis was on this. So typically when we're looking at the CEQA evaluation, we find, you know, if the project is exempt, if, if it's a single family home, most often it's an exemption for under CEQA. Uh, as the attorney did mention, there certainly are exceptions to when those had things occur. So when staff looked at uh, some of these issues, you know, we go back to what we understand is kind of the documents that we typically see or we use to guide us when we're making a decision for CEQA uh, and CEQA exemption. So typically that, that involves the CVMS HCP, the multi-species habitat plan um, to address, you know, wildlife and habitat issues to, you know, to mitigate areas that should be protected and then um, preserve areas that are identified as, you know, conservation areas. Um, so that, the, and under that document, these houses fall, or these lots fall with, or fall outside of the protected area. Um, so we didn't see that as being an issue. Uh, when it comes to hydrology and flooding, um, there is, uh, there has been issues relative to flooding that have been identified. There has been pictures submitted of homes that have, have dealt with this issue. Um, but, you know, under current standards, when we evaluated it, we had to evaluate it, you know, on, to ensure that Flooding, when it happens, it's being conveyed appropriately um, and it's not impacting adjacent structures to current standards. Um, so, as I mentioned, the engineers have confirmed that um, the latest iteration of their preliminary hydrology plan um, does meet uh, city standards relative to um, flood and hydrology issues. Uh, so, again, I think it, um, we kind of went through all of those checks to make sure that we didn't feel or that we felt that. Um, there wasn't certainly an exception to what we typically would see for um, a class one or class three exemption in this case. Uh, the, uh, lastly, I'll just state that the argument about um, number of homes, uh, when we looked at that issue, we identified that there are two applications on file um, with the city. Uh, we have, the applicant has mentioned that he does on adjacent lots and he may or may not um, develop those lots. And, until the city has received an application, we have not identified more than two lots as being um, developed under CEQA. So that's kind of the basis for that, um, that decision. Great. And if a year from now, another two or three lots were proposed, would these two impact that CEQA decision? Or is as long as you go two, two, and one, you can get to five under CEQA? That's what I'm trying to understand. So I think, uh, you know, it, we would evaluate those applications as they came in. So if we did, under, you know, if there were two more applications that came in or one more application and we are looking at it, the whole picture is, you know, the cumulative impact with that, can we still make that finding that, I mean, I guess that's a question we'll have to answer when that comes in. But at this point, I, you know, that's not something we made it a basis for because under the current evidence that we have, it's, it, there's only two applications before the city, and I don't know if the city attorney has other yeah. thoughts about that, but... That's what I was going to ask next. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will say the letter raises some interesting questions from a CEQA perspective. You know, um, it, it's my understanding that when this these uh, two applications came in, um, there wasn't really a discussion about developing the other lots. Um, there were some statements made, I think, um, earlier in the process that suggests that those could be developed by this developer. Um, and that does raise the prospect of whether we could rely on this CEQA exemption. Uh, those lots are across the, the canyon, so a court might say they really aren't this, the same part of this process. But I think uh, we'd want to really look at that. And if the council's inclined to overturn the Planning Commission's uh, decision, I think we'd want to um, have the council give us direction to go back and, and address the letter 
um, so that we have that in the record uh, for, our, for our council approval of this project if the council is inclined to go that direction. Okay, thank you. Council Member Holstitch. Thank you. Very much like Council Member of course, going first because you asked the same questions as me. So good job. Um, thank you for that. I was going to do the exact same thing. Um, I just have a follow-up question if I can. So on page 674 of 680 pages for the first item 2A, uh, it's the letter from CDFW. California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So their letter states that um, they're remarking on the case and stating that um, the case occurs within or directly adjacent to the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains Conservation Area described in the MSHCP. All three projects contain fish and wildlife resources that are subject to the Fish and Game Code and have potential impacts to the fully protected peninsular bighorn sheep. So can you describe, I, I heard you say that it's not within um, the MSHCP, is it adjacent to, or would that just be more analysis that's needed? We're not typically used to getting CDFW letters in these cases. Is what, what, if you don't mind, what was the date of that letter? Sure, that is January 25th of this year. I think, I think that was during the time when the commission was considering three items um, in the yeah. neighborhood. So there was there. there was it references three items. Three items, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so one of those three items, which is not on the agenda, which is the it was a um, a, a road adjacent to uh, MSHCP area, mm. and so that was I think the reference in that uh, letter was that was specifically what they were identifying was the road that was directly adjacent to the. Right. It's hard. It's a little hard for us to follow because it just says case three point four two seven three DP. And then that, so that would be the third one. But it does say all three projects contain fish and wildlife resources subject to the Fish and Game Code. So do we have analysis of, of that impact? Uh, we don't have any specific analysis to, uh, to substantiate that. And then was, did the Planning Commission or city staff further analyze that or discuss it with CDFW? Um, no, staff did not. Okay. Are we required to by law? No, because the CEQA exemption applies? Uh, in staff's perspective, when we looked at the project, we identified that, yeah, the CEQA exemption would be applicable. But, uh, you know, if ultimately the council or the planning commission decided that they wanted more information to substantiate that information, we could have done that additional um, research and documentation. Thank you. And that would be the exemption of the new single family residents. Correct. Okay. Um, and I just have one more question for city staff if I can. So we heard the public comment and the neighbors discuss the mass and scale of the neighborhood and, and fitting within um, being consistent with. Um, and then we heard the applicant or appellant now um, talking about the comparison to the houses directly surrounding versus the overall neighborhood. So could you just comment on staff's opinion about which to compare to and if these proposed projects, it sounds like staff had just determined and recommended that it fits the mass and scale of the neighborhood. Could you just comment on staff's recommendations there? Yes. So the, um, you know, the neighborhood is quite eclectic. There are um, mid-century modern um, structures. There's Spanish-influenced structures. Uh, obviously, when it comes to the the more mid-century lineal horizontal massing of of the of that design, um, it can create more of a massing effect. Um, but in terms of how the project has evolved through the design process, I think uh, in terms of our recommendation, we felt that it was compatible uh, and can, not out of character for the um, homes in the neighborhood because there are homes that some you have two-story designs. Um, in that neighborhood. So from our perspective, staff um, reviewed what the context of the, pro, uh, the projects were relative to the neighborhood and didn't find it out of character. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? It might be for the city attorney. This might be a stupid question, but so if the applicant the applicant's bringing forward these two projects, he owns three other parcels, the single family exemption applies 
staff has decided to these two. Um, but if all five were being brought forward, it might need additional analysis. But I'm trying to like wrap my head around the logic of if other people, private entities bought the other parcels, if, if they were bought by all individual people, they could all develop single family homes. So with the exemption, so what's the justification and what's the reasoning for CEQA to require additional review? Right, so that, that's actually a good question. So the exemption that we're relying on uh, right now is um, an exemption for construction of new homes up to three homes. And so with two homes, we believe it would fit within that, um, within the parameters of that uh, initial part of the exemption. Um, if there are other lots that are being proposed or contemplated by this developer, uh, the argument is that it falls outside of that three home exemption under CEQA. I see, I think that's a really narrow issue we haven't seen before, I haven't seen before up here. Um, and so, okay, so it's just the, it doesn't look at the sort of, um, geographic area, CEQA is just really designed for like the, the scale of the development overall. Correct. The CEQA says you need to consider the whole of the action. In this case, the issue is, is the action development of two homes or is it potentially development of five homes? Thanks. So what we have before us is two homes, correct? Thanks. Uh, David, uh, Planning Commission made uh, determination that uh, the, these properties uh, are, as proposed, uh, are not harmonious uh, to the relationship of adjoining developments in the neighborhood. What is the discretion that the Planning Commission has, and what uh, are the factors that uh, they should take in coming to their judgment? So um, under the prior architectural review ordinance, which is the, um, the ordinance that was in effect at the time these applications were submitted, uh, there's mm -hmm. several criteria that they do have to consider um, to, to approve an application. You know, those relate to site layout, orientation of structures, and relationship to um, open spaces and topography. So all of those things they do take into consideration when um, looking at a project. They talk, the criteria also talks about harmonious relationship with existing and proposed adjoining developments in the context of the immediate neighborhood. Um, and then height, setbacks, all of the development standards that are typically um, required of a single family home. So in general, you know, as I said, the three that they could not find were relative to those findings. Um, and then the minor modification application for the setback and the height, um, the commission didn't find that the, the height was appropriate based on um, the issues before them. So. Right. And so the height, though, is, uh, is a critical issue, is it not? Yes. Yep, the and most particularly at uh, at the corners. Correct. So based on uh, you know the building mass, the height mm -hmm. of that mass, uh, the commission denied the project. Are there other questions, or is it time to move to uh, council member comments? Uh, go ahead, uh, council member Woods. You know, um, I. I I actually looked at a house around the corner to buy. <laughs> so, and, and, and you know, you look at two houses down or three houses down and it's it appears, when I'm looking at the map right now, it appears that it's less, it's not 25 feet set back from the street. So I, I would agree with staff that it's very eclectic up there, which actually gives the, the area its charm. But one thing I wanted to ask is, um, just looking at the, the, the houses on the side, it looks like the pool, pools are backloaded on the canyon side, as I'm looking at um, a map. I think the pools they're proposing are on the street side, which actually may push the building itself back further into the canyon. During this whole long, it sounds like a very long process they went through, did we look at... Um, so uh, let me back up. The pools are actually build, uh, are being put on the buildable pad that the, um, that's in the white up there. If you look on, on three, the little square, which is the buildable pad where a house could actually go, not a pool. 
was that a, was there any consideration to flipping that in, in, during this long process? Where the house would not cantilever so much, but maybe the pool would, but the pool doesn't have the same height as a building does. Yeah, so I think you, you can see that in the second iteration on the screen where they have uh, the house more oriented towards the center of the lot with a pool in the rear. And that was not pursued that you know of, but we can ask the applicant because because they felt that orient the structure and the, um, the design should be pushed closer towards the street to reduce its impact on the back of the lot. Wait, I, I'm not sure I understood that. Um, because Cheryl. you see, the, it's an L-shaped design in the, yes, in the yes. middle one. So it did, it, it did extend out uh, towards the rear in that, in that iteration. So that's why uh, when they were looking at it, they, the, I think the committee felt that it wasn't necessarily that they had to push the structure back, but they... Um, because it, it does have you know greater impacts at the rear when you're where it's a much lower elevation, uh, so that's why then when they brought back the revised design they pushed it forward. But I think the the applicant provide more um, details on kind of how they their thought process was on the design iterations. Can we can we get that? Would you mind you know briefly? And um, was that a request from AEC or how, how did that happen? Yes. Yeah, so. We did present that option where the, there was an option where the pool was over the hillside and not the house. Um, unanimously, unanimously, the AAC did not really like that design proposal. And okay. it was, um, sentiment was that we should go back to the previous one, but just try to pull it back further to the street so that it's not overhanging the hillside as much. That's why in the end, we were about 15 to 16 feet less than we originally submitted um, again, just to comment, because I'm an architect and I'm technical, um, pools are very heavy structures. It's very difficult to build a, a pool without grading that slope, and that was one of the main reasons why the pool was always going to be anchored in that buildable lot area, because the, the house itself could float over that steep hillside. Um, we did propose that option. Um, it would have had it would have had to have required the engineering department to give it an allowance to grade. Um, Great. So, Thank you very much on that. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up follow question of you? Um, I think you had said, you just referenced it, that the city staff had talked to you about grading and what was allowable. Could you just describe that conversation and what was told to sure, you about grading? It was, it was explained to us that on hillside lots that um, slopes that exceed 30% um, don't allow grading and the term basically changing the the level creating pads putting in foundation walls that would all be considered grading in that area now piers that's a different story you're just going directly down you're not altering the the, the natural slope that's why the the original designs were proposed the way they were This has been such a lengthy process with so many meetings. We had two uh, in, um, um, outreach meetings with the neighbors. Um, and one issue that did come up uh, was the location of these pools. They did not want to see them, uh, the uh, ones I talked to, did not want to see them in the front yard or in the rear yard necessarily because of the noise, uh, because of the, the exposure within the canyon there in the rear to all the other homes. And then, of course, the same thing on the front. They didn't, um, being that they're closer to the street, they didn't want to have all the uh, noise from a, uh, the activity that a pool right. would Thank you. demonstrate. So that was also part of the reason for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your frustration in the process. And I apologize that it's been so long. And it's not how the process, that we intend the process to work. And that's why we uh, changed the process and made it shorter and also reduced the amount of continuances and things like that. So I apologize for the delay in the cost. So are we now to the point of offering comments? All right. Uh, I think the Planning Commission got it right and uh, that uh, uh, the mass and the scale of these buildings, most particularly as they 
uh, back into the uh, lots in the rear uh, are really out of uh, character with any of the other homes that are uh, within the uh, neighborhood. When you look at some of the homes that are in the neighborhood that are substantially larger, uh, they have much greater footprints that uh, they set into, and they set into the topography of the uh, property in a vastly different uh, fashion than what uh, uh, these homes uh, as proposed to. Uh, the cantilever and the extent that they come out uh, into the back, it pushes them well beyond uh, anything else that's in the neighborhood. When you look at the homes that one, two, three, up uh, Crestview, uh, those homes sit into, uh, do not extend out into the canyon. They sit uh, on lots that uh, uh, that work. So I, I, I think that one of the comments that is the m most telling is this is one of our oldest neighborhoods. It is some of the very earliest homes uh, that were built in Palm Springs. And the fact that these lots were not built on was because the challenges to building on them are immense. You have most of the lot in both of these at a 30% grade or more. Uh, so uh, I really appreciate how hard we have worked uh, and the applicant has worked and the community has worked uh, to try to get this uh, to a point where there could be something that could be approved. The reason it has taken so long is not because our process is broken, but because the challenges of building on these lots are so severe. Um, appreciate that. I think I have a different take. Because um, we changed the process, so AAC did this kind of work. And it didn't go to a different commission that really wouldn't be doing this work. And they were unanimous on it, and staff supported it. Um, my concern, though, which is where I'm still, I won't say confused, um, struggling, um, is on CEQA. And I agree with Councilmember Holstich. It seems really odd that um, if they were doing three and sold the other two and someone else brought the other two, then it's fine. But because they own the others, it's not. And so, um, and obviously a sequel lawsuit is going to cost both of sides a lot of money. And so I'm just wondering, would we be looking at a different, you know, sequel analysis because they own the other lots? I'm still really unclear on that. Yeah, please. If you understand, please. I don't have an answer. I think I heard staff. I agree with your position. Um, so I, I appreciate um, Mayor Middleton and um, in your analysis there. I think um, I agree with what was just said with Council Member Coors. Um, but what I heard staff say, and that's my position, um, is to do further CEQA analysis and respond um, and analyze that letter um, and respond whenever there's attorneys involved. And there's a, we've received attorneys on all the sides. We've served, received a lot of letters um, and analysis here. It's concerning about the liability for the city. And so I'm a little concerned either way if you have a comment on that. But do you have a recommendation about what that would look like in terms of additional review by the city to um, protect ourselves and ensure that CEQA is properly done? I think if the council is inclined to uh, uphold the appeal and overturn the Planning Commission's action, uh, at a minimum, I think we'd want to respond to the comment letters. We probably would also want to talk to the applicant about, the, about whether they want to do additional CEQA review, whether that's a negative declaration or a mitigated negative declaration. Um, I wouldn't recommend that we rely on uh, the record as it stands tonight, though. Thank you. And my request would that be that the city staff do that analysis and response. One more thing on the CEQA before the planner gets involved on the, <laughs> right on the planning. Um, um, as I understand it, like with most 
projects, um, it would really be the would the city have liability, or is it the applicant who really ultimately oh. has to indemnify on sequel lawsuits? I should have been more clear. If yeah. if the city were to approve the project and we were sued uh, by the by the um, um, by anybody, um, the developer, the applicant be, would be required to indemnify us and basically pay the city's legal costs for defending the lawsuit. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Woods. Um, there's a very historic uh, house. There's many historic houses in this neighborhood, but one of them is called um, Ship of the Desert, and it is um, a very famous house here in Palm Springs. And I just pulled up a picture of it. I'm sorry I can't put it up there. Um, I, I guess I can pass it around to my council members, but it actually, you know, it uh, is not much different in scale than what they're looking at. It's, it's further away from the neighbors. Um, than that, but uh, it's, it sticks out over the canyon, um, and it's predominant from uh, the street view. Um, this particular project won't be predominant from the street view, only the canyon view. So I'll just pass my phone around and share that with people, but I think there's precedence in the neighborhood already of um, you know, different homes and homes that are bigger and homes that are smaller, and I don't know as I have that big of an issue with it. Thank you. Yeah. I understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Or you can pull it up on your own phone if you want. <laughs> Oops. All right. Uh, further comments? Is there a motion? Uh, and City Attorney, help me here, and we'll see if there's a second for it. Um, I would um, overturn the Planning Commission with, the, with a review of the legalities um, in regards to the letter that we received from, um, from the homeowners. And um, I'll leave it at that, and I'll tell you my justification for it. I think um, the mayor said it very clearly. The lots are almost unbuildable unless we give some give to make it happen. I don't want to strip somebody of a right to build in the Palm Springs area or only build, I think it was quoted, a 900 square foot home uh, in the city. And so I, I just, I, you know, I, I think they've gone through a very long process to try and get something that works. I think the neighbors have been very involved, which I totally applaud. Um, I think it will probably help the real estate values in the area versus hinder them. So I make the motion again with a legal review by our team. If I might um, just try to help frame that motion, um, I, my recommendation would be that that direction be given to staff to work with the applicant to come back and bring back a resolution for a consent calendar action at the next available meeting. Uh, whereby we would address the, the findings that you've just articulated as well as uh, responding to the, to the CEQA issues. Uh, that's my motion. <laughs> okay. it, now, we've, we've finished with public comment. Uh, is there a second? I will second that motion um, with, I don't think it has to be a friendly amendment because I think it's included. Um, in including uh, the staff findings that are in the resolution um, to overturn the planning commission. Right? What you intended? Yep, Thank you. Absolutely. Vote. Motion carries 3-1. All right. Uh, we have reached uh, 10 o'clock, and that is the hour in which we move forward with uh, non-agenda public comments. So could we uh, make those phone calls?
Tracy Folk, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you. Esteemed Mayor and Council Members, um, I am a member of the Women's Entrepreneur Club of Palm Springs, which is a collective of women business owners who bring revenue to our city. We recently arranged a meeting with the Palm Springs Police Force to discuss our concerns regarding crime in the city and what ensued was an informative discussion regarding the challenges that our understaffed police force is facing while trying to manage the number of 911 calls. They are finding it ever more difficult to meet with the high demand in a timely fashion and to keep up with the city's growing needs which concerns us. We were informed that Palm Springs has only five day patrol officers for a population of 44,500, covering an area of 94.5 square miles. Additionally, approximately 1.6 million tourists visit Palm Springs annually which amounts to 133,000 visitors per month. In a city the size of Palm Springs, our understaffed police force is struggling to keep up with the demand. Presently, the police are unable to engage in preventive monitoring measures that help prevent crime simply because they don't have enough officers. Our research also found that Palm Springs Police Force is paid 20% less than the police departments in other desert cities and has a reduced training budget, which greatly retards efforts for staff retention or to hire additional police in our city. While police in other desert cities... Thank you, ma'am. Your time is done. Madam Mayor, that concludes public comment. Then uh, we are past 10 o'clock. We have two items left, plus uh, City Council and comments and requests. Uh, do we want to proceed with both of the two items? All right, does anyone need a break before we proceed? All right, then we will move forward. We have finished items 3A and 3B previously. Uh, this is item 3C, an increase in the annual limit of household consultant services agreement with Lessar Development Consultants. Staff report, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, no Mayor Pro Tem, members of the city council. Um, <clears throat> so when the agreement with Lassar Development Consultants was first approved, our estimate of the work to be done was $110,000 uh, annually for up to four years. So that's a total agreement for $440,000. And we structured that agreement to have yearly, one-year options because we were also in the process of trying to uh, hire a uh, housing services administrator. Unfortunately, uh, we, uh, despite having two offers made, uh, still do not have anyone in that position. Um, so as the workload for Lassar increased, uh, as they helped us with establishing an access center, creating a network of homeless service providers, uh, closing affordable housing financings, and uh, planning and financing for the Navigation Center, uh, we had to rely on LASAR more, and consequently the rate of expenditures increased uh, to the point where uh, we believe it's necessary to uh, increase the amount of the, uh, not, the not to exceed amount for this agreement so that uh, they can continue their work on uh, the high priority items that they are working on. And um, what we've come up with them is to increase 
the annual not to exceed amount to 255,000 annually. Uh, and so if that's continued for the next three years, the total agreement amount would come out to about 875,000 if we need to work with them that extensively. Now, these uh, projects, as you know, are paid for through the HAP $10 million uh, state grant and uh, through the uh, former redevelopment agency affordable housing funds. Um, however, we're finding the vast majority of their work is with homelessness at this point. And moving forward, there's still a substantial amount of work that needs to be done, uh, particularly for the navigation center, which would include uh, holding stakeholder and community outreach meetings, creating and facilitating a resident advisory working group that would sort of be the, the group monitoring the progress, the design, the progress and operations of the navigation center. And they would help us with facilitating meetings with this group on a monthly basis. And um, coordinating the build out of the navigation center, which is project management type of work and identifying additional funds that may come into play to help uh, su sustain the operations. Um, other work that they're planning on doing and have already initiated are homeless services gaps analysis, uh, creating affordable housing and home ownership programs, identifying and applying for more sources of funding, as I had mentioned, um, and uh, you know, as we do that, we are still concurrently trying to add more staff to the department so that uh, our reliance on outsourced, outside resources would, would be decreased. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there questions for staff? Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for all your work. Um, I have a question. There was public comment about including a nexus study or other analysis for inclusionary uh, policies or other affordable housing policies that the city is considering. Um, so could you just comment if that would be properly included here? My, maybe this is a question for the city manager. Properly included in this agreement or increasing the limit to do that work? We also heard a public comment uh, from uh, Desert Highlands uh, leaders asking about uh, work to, frankly, um, overcome the re down zoning that the city did in the 90s for some of those lots and developing some of those parcels like Coachella Valley Housing Coalition did, um, which I know the city council has interest in. So could you just comment if that work should properly be done in this or added to this agreement? Yes, I believe uh, I would have to check with them on the Nexus study. I believe that can get to be uh, quite technical, although they do have uh, expertise in uh, assigning or determining uh, uh, new commercial development and the need for housing associated with that. That's my understanding of a Nexus study and uh, inclusionary housing. Um, and as far as overcoming the down zoning uh, that's established, um, th they can definitely assist with that, but I would think our uh, capable planning department could also, uh, in working with our capable planning department, would also help accomplish that unless there are other particular issues to be addressed. On that, uh, I should also mention they've already started looking at possibilities in the Desert Highlands community, and one of the recommendations they've been pursuing is a um, community land trust where city-owned properties uh, could be developed. The building would be owned by an individual. The land would be retained by the city. And so the building and any built up equity could be sold, but the city would retain the land. So that was one proposal they had that they thought might uh, fit the needs for the city at this time. So they could flesh that out more and it's, it's already in our agreement for them to work on that type of work. Thank you, it's really helpful. I look forward to doing that work together. Other questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? Motion and second, vote. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to item 4D, to uh, general plan limited update, a review of revisions to the general plan, vision and priority statements and draft land use plan. Uh, and just before we get into this, uh, uh, Council Member Woods is conflicted. Should we get into a specific discussion of boulders or crescendo? Uh, should that come up, I will pause the meeting uh, in order to provide him with an opportunity to uh, step away. Uh, but he is not conflicted from a general conversation of open space. So staff report, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, council members. As you recall, we, uh, we've, we've reviewed the vision and priority statements for the uh, 2040 general plan on a few occasions, most recently at your March 10th meeting where we discussed uh, changing, making some minor changes to our vision statement and some other changes to our priorities. So based on that discussion that we had on March 10th, I've consolidated uh, priority number 10 and new priority number two in the list of, uh, of those that we had identified at that time into other priorities and remove those from the priority list uh, based on the comments we heard. We're, there were no changes made to priority number one, five, six, eight, or pro new priority number three. And we revised priorities two, three, four, seven, and nine, as well as new priority number one, um, based on your feedback. So um, that's kind of a, just a basic summary of the changes that were made. Um, we'll also discuss tonight the land use plan, including descriptions, um, specific property designations, and the build-out projections. So going, sorry, going into the vision statement, uh, this, is, uh, this is primarily the only one I wanted to just touch on. Um, we removed some language relative uh, to the uh, individual's experience here in Palm Springs. So we took out the words relaxing and positive and replaced it just to say we have an enjoyable experience. We also removed the word resort uh, and made some other adjustments to uh, the text. So what you see on the right is the proposed vision statement. Um, and so those are, that's really the only thing I really wanted to touch on. If there's any questions on the other items that, uh, or other changes that I made to the priorities, I'm certainly happy to answer those questions, but I believe that the items you see in your staff report um, are consistent with the discussion that was had back on March 10th. Uh, questions for uh, David? Uh, Council right. Member Woods. Just a comment, uh, David, and um, I'm looking at uh, page um, 3D-4 um, on the far right column, which is the amend on the bottom. Um, it says, uh, foster enhance opportunities for open space retention and expansion that allows for neighbor to access through Palm Springs and its adjacent areas. I personally think um, that's fine, but I think we should say foster enhance opportunities for open space, period. Not all open space is gonna actually lead to allow access. And then after the period, we can just keep the same thing but make it a complete sentence. Does that make any sense? So we would say a foster and enhance opportunities for open space, period. And then it could say something like find, you know, um, uh, whatever the beginning is, um, retention and expression that allows neighborhood through Palm Springs. My, my point is not every piece of open space is gonna give you access through a neighborhood. So however you want to write that up. Um. Other questions or comments? Uh, David, I have a couple are, of questions and I want to turn to uh, 3D page 14. As I understand it, where we're projecting moving from 35,524 existing housing units to a max out of 51,547, that's reflective of the RENA numbers. Is that correct? Correct. 
There's been minor increases to certain residential designations. So that's an increase of uh, almost 50% of the number of housing units in the city. Uh, what's the time frame uh, that that's projected to take place over? So um, the figure in the middle, the current general plan, the 48,507, that was what was in our 2007 general plan. Um, we obviously haven't achieved that as of 2022. Um, so it's just, you know, in the, if for whatever reason, Palm Springs just started booming and redevelopment started occurring and people started maximizing or getting close to higher density limits, um, that at that point we would assume that you know, that's the most that capacity that we would have in terms of household units. Uh, so uh, help me, are these arena numbers ones that we need to achieve at some point in time? Correct, yeah. So the intent so with arena What's is, that time? What, what is that time? Five years, 10, 15, 20? Yeah, so the arena is an eight-year, it's an eight-year cycle. I'm sorry? It's an eight-year cycle period. Oh. So they're projecting over the course of eight years, we would need to build almost half as many housing units as we have right now. Sorry, I don't. Maybe I wasn't um, being uh, clear. The, these these are really just projections for us to do the environmental analysis necessary under the general plan. Um, the arena numbers that we have are about um, 2,500 units that are required within the eight-year period. 2,500 over the next Correct. eight years. We have to plan for um, a range of incomes for 2,500 units in that eight-year period. Right. Uh, and how far along are we in planning for those 2,500 units over the course of the next eight years? So uh, we've identified all of the sites that we believe would accommodate all of those units in the eight-year period. Whether or not that comes to fruition ultimately depends on number of factors. Do we have that uh, map uh, available? Um, the land use map we do have as a part of our presentation it is one of the attachments, but it doesn't identify the specific um, okay. parcels that are part of the 2,500 units. And I'm not advocating that we jump ahead to do that uh, in most clearly this evening, but... Uh, I think we do need to take a look, uh, particularly eight years, 10 years out, and identify what are the housing goals that we need to meet. And uh, to borrow language that came from, I think, the city manager, uh, what are the, uh, the most uh, viable properties uh, for us to take and have that build out? Uh, take place. If we're going to get serious about uh, meeting the housing needs of this community, we're going to have to identify uh, where's that uh, building going to take place. And the corollary to that is identify what are the most sensitive uh, areas that we should not be building in. But what, uh, uh, in my experience, tends to happen is a piece of property becomes available uh, and then we deal with that piece of property as a one-off. Uh, and I'd like to see us try to plan uh, for where can we build, where do we definitely do not want to build. Okay. The uh, next question I had uh, in actually does come to a very specific question with regard to uh, boulders and crescendo. So there's been a tremendous amount of debate and discussion on these properties going back for, uh, I think, 20 years, uh, if not longer. Uh, we have received a letter from uh, Oswit Land Trust 
uh, asking that these properties be designated as open space. And that certainly has been the desire of any number of individuals. There's also been very strong opposition uh, at times to, uh, to that. What would be the appropriate process for bringing before city council a discussion as to whether or not uh, these two properties should be uh, identified as open space? So staff has identified in the report um, that there's there may be some challenges with changing um, parcels uh, down or down zoning or down um, designating parcels. Um, and obviously, if it's um, a smaller area, that would be less of problematic. But if we're looking at the three areas that we've identified in the report, it's the uh, the Boulders property, the Crescendo property, and the Palm Hills property. Uh, we did we did receive comments from um, members of the public and um, preservation organization or conservation organizations relative to these sites and preserving them or uh, retaining them as open space or changing the designations to open space. Um, as identified here, Boulders it does it is a 30 acre site. Um, it has a designation of up to two dwelling units per acre. Um, there is an existing subdivision with 45 lots. Uh, so I, we could assume that there would be a loss of 45 units with a change to this property. When looking at the Crescendo property, it's a 41 and a half acre parcel of land. Um, previously, there was an entitlement for 79 lots. Um, it is a two unit per acre designation. So the assumption there would be we'd lose about 80 um, 80 units uh, and then lastly the Palm Hills property it's it's 1200 acres or roughly two square miles uh, which is shown here in the turquoise and um, green color in the center of the map um, and that is described as having up to 1200 units if a specific plan is adopted so uh, when accounting for these three areas which have been the kind of most talked about relative to um, changing the designations to open space. Um, in totality, you're looking at roughly 1,300 units, uh, 1,320 or so units that would we would have to uh, address elsewhere in our land use plan. Sure. Uh, so that means um, finding density somewhere else because of SB 330, the state law that says um, cities cannot um, cities are required to have a no net loss of units based on their 2018 plan. Um, so that's something that the council can consider. Yeah, and I really appreciate that uh, background, but uh, I wasn't trying to get to a debate or a discussion as to whether we should or should not do this, uh, but to ask the question, how would we entertain that debate? How would we bring that, those issues before us? And given that uh, Boulders and Crescendo are owned by the city and Palm Hills is privately owned, it would seem that it would be appropriate to deal with those uh, properties uh, or to deal with Palm Hills uh, separately from Boulders and Crescendo. Uh, Council Member Coors. Yeah. Uh, thank you for raising that. Um, you know, the, we did. We had set up a process um, before our city manager worked with us, where we were going to actually try and get from brokers what the properties are actually worth, so we can share with the public. Um, you know, are they worth a total of eight million, as some say, or are they worth more than thirty-five million, as others say? And we've had a, you know appraisals, but things have changed since we did those. Um, so we could then have an educated conversation, right? And um, the people who are opposed to any development there, and you know, I appreciate um, open space, I'm a big proponent, didn't want us to even do that. But I think it's hard to have the conversation, um, and I think uh, um, Director Veranda did a great job in getting us a plan, and was supposed to come back to us, and I don't know if COVID hit and it just never came back to us, but that was a couple of years ago. And um, because I think what, in my view, we need to do is actually know the value, let the public know, right? If let's just argue, if there were 30 million, it may not. For some people, it won't change anything what they're worth. It may not change it for any of us. But we, 
the public has the right to know that information before we make a decision. Um, and so I think it would be useful to have that. And the other piece, um, which we've talked about, uh, but um, was just having a sense as we look out at the long-term build out of the city, right? Which um, I don't think we're getting to all those numbers very soon, but um, what's the priority for open space? What's the priority for housing? What's the priority for commercial industrial? Um, and do this in a global way so it's smart and strategic instead of one-offs. Um, but in the meantime, and it would, you know, it would affect, right, there is this, the issue we'd have to find other place for the density. In the meantime, one of them has to get a specific plan that's privately owned. The other two are owned by the city, and we're not doing anything to have them developed. So they're de facto open space at the moment for all intent and purposes, which is what people want. They don't want to see people who don't want to see them built. They're not going to be built until we've gone through a process. And I just want us to do it smartly. And these may be the top three properties for open space, but I don't want doing it one off is not wise in my view. And I don't know where we fit that in time wise, but it wasn't in the next couple of months. I know that for certain. Uh, so maybe city manager can weigh in. Yeah, I'm happy to address at least part of that. I think um, as indicated, it would be ideal if you had comprehensive planning looking broadly at open space and housing so that you could reconcile the tension between the two. And ideally, you would have a number of parcels that are high value for open space, low value for housing, and the reverse. Something like that would take more time. What I think we have on a nearer horizon is a plan to also look at all of the city holdings from the perspective of at least opportunity for housing, which is something else that council has asked for. And that is just beyond our first segment of work planning that we had already done, which indicates you know sometime around this summer. So even in that analysis, what we could do with those city parcels, not more broadly, but start to maybe rank them in terms of opportunity for housing, and then we could also look at them from the perspective of their value for open space, start a conversation from there. That would address the planning component. Outside of that process, at any point we could place on the agenda again, make a decision to move forward with brokers or anything else that might help us to understand value. But that might be, when we come back um, and look at them from the perspective of housing and open space, might be the ideal time to do that because you might even identify a few other parcels that are city holdings where you want to do the same thing, and we could do it all at the same time. I think that's an appropriate process, but uh, at some point we need to actually uh, sit down and engage the conversation uh, in a very thoughtful way with uh, the public, and I very much appreciate the way uh, that you're phrasing the conversation. What, what properties are going to work for housing? Which ones are most important to preserve for open space? Uh, but. Uh, this may not be very popular to say. Uh, if every piece of property has to be preserved for open space, we will not be able to ever meet our housing goals. So we're going to have to make some decisions as to what are the properties where housing is the priority. I think that process makes sense. Um, Uh, with that, I think that covers my question specific to Boulders and Crescendo, if we want to uh, welcome Mr. Uh, Councilmember Woods back in.
Welcome back. And uh, so that exhausts my questions. Are there any questions from any other member of council? Council member Woods. Uh, thank you. David, on page um, 3D-14, uh, just to follow the mayor. Um, the difference between the households and the housing units, um, that spread, um, uh, it seems like in the city of Palm Springs, that spread, I understand it's from SCAG by the footnote, but I wonder if that's actually accurate because we have so many second homes here that are not occupied. Mm -hmm. So to have 48,900, almost 49,000 occupied and 51,547 housing units seems off when we know we already have 2,000 vacation rentals. Uh, it seems like that spread should be more than what it actually is. And um, I don't know if, if it's, I, I know it's not our analysis, but maybe we need to talk to SCAG about that. And they may not know the region as quick as, as well as we do. And we probably now with STRs probably have better information to give them, but I just, your feedback would be great. Yeah, so I think in terms of what the, the table is really trying to uh, get towards, it, we identify what we believe is existing in the first column. So we believe that you know, from the data that we, we have, we have 23,000 currently uh, households and housing units, uh, 35,524. Our 2007 general plan identified, uh, you know, at the full potential build out, if we were to develop all of the the land uses um, to their to the kind of the greatest extent, and what's the greatest impact when we're looking at the environmental analysis um, side of of the project? How much, you know, can we, we does our circulation network is it able to handle that capacity? Uh, you know, do we have all of the, you know, our, what are the kind of the impacts overall with having um, that higher number of households being um, developed in the city? And then, of course, as you say, if in the event the city, um, you know, currently we, we say 65% occupancy rate, um, that, that could be higher or lower. I mean, if depending on, you know, vacation rental status in the city. But um, for planning purposes, what we, we look at when we're trying to ensure that the plan addresses all of the impacts that were, you know, might, that need to be considered when looking at the potential build out of the city, that's when we start looking at these higher numbers, these higher occupancies um, in the general plan. Great, thank you. Are there other questions, comments? Councilmember Halstead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We received public comment. Um, you probably saw um, from Desert Highlands Gateway Estates about um, general plan updates um, requests. And I saw that, and I know we discussed those previously, and I saw that a number of them were incorporated. And then we also got a public comment um, from Inland Equity Partnership um, in support of that proposal. Um, so I just wanted to confirm with you that you received that and that this is, that's included here. Uh, correct. Yeah, so we did identify um, per the discussion that the council had last July uh, certain modifications that were desirable relative to those comments and, and the Desert Highland comments uh, have been incorporated into the proposed land use plan. Thank you. If there are no other comments, is there a motion to approve? Uh, Madam Mayor, no motion is uh, required tonight. It's really just direction to understand right. that staff has, uh, the plan is as you see appropriate um, and that the vision and priorities are uh, basically what we were discussed last time. So we, I think we have our direction and uh, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. That brings us to city council and city manager comments, reports, and agenda development. Any comments from any council? Um, I have some if we have the slide. 
that I've seen through in my comments. If not, someone else should go. Yeah, Council, if, if you're wanting to see the future meetings, uh, tentative meetings. No. Talks, I've, oh, you have something. Sorry. Yeah, I had a. My mistake. Yep. There was a slide. Here we go. Yay. Yay. Okay, we have a picture. Um, so I had the uh, pleasure and honor of um, being part of Eisenhower Health's um, dedication of uh, their Plaza de Sol primary care facility the name to Alan Brimble and Richard Lyle Jones. Um, and it's the first of um, Eisenhower facility in the city of Palm Springs to be named and the first time they've ne ever named um, anything after a same-sex couple. And uh, they, two gentlemen made a very significant um, donation as they have over years uh, to Eisenhower Medical Center in honor of their 50th wedding anniversary. Um, so it's just a really nice ceremony. And it was just a reminder that, you know, the philanthropy in Palm Springs and in this valley um, makes the difference it does. Because, you know, 80% of the patients that Eisenhower sees are either Medi-Cal or Medicare. And to provide the health care at the level they do would not be possible without that philanthropy. So I just want to thank... Um, Thank them for being here so people have options in healthcare, but really congratulate uh, the two gentlemen um, on this great honor and on their 50th wedding anniversary. It was a really nice ceremony. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Other comments uh, from council? And I do have a few, and uh, one that I'll take a little bit of extra time for. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that uh, tomorrow evening between 7 and 8 p.m. is the annual KESQ Find Food Bank Telethon. Uh, this is a great opportunity to give to the community, and I really encourage everyone who can to tune in to KESQ tomorrow between 7 and 8 for the Find uh, Food Bank, and uh, I'll be honored to be there. Uh, representing the city uh, and calling out and, and accepting uh, donations as they uh, come in. Uh, last Thursday, we attended the Senior Inspiration Awards uh, at Fantasy Springs. It's one of the really wonderful events in the Coachella Valley. Uh, there were uh, 11 different seniors that were recognized for their lifetime of achievements and contributions and our own Kathy Cohn uh, from the Sunrise Park neighborhood represented Palm Springs in winning that award. Uh, within the last week, we have had uh, the Palm Springs Air Museum have a couple of really big events, the opening of the James Houston hangar, as well as their uh, museum gala, which was a really uh, well-attended event. Uh, uh, the American Legion uh, just recently celebrated, uh, or I should say memorialized, the 50th anniversary of the last combat troops leaving uh, Vietnam, and it was really uh, a good event uh, on March 29th uh, to see so many uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, tomorrow, there's an event that's really big on my calendar and one we've been working on for a very long time. At 10 a.m., there will be a press conference and celebration of the passage of AB 43. Uh, that will be held at, fire, at the fire station at 1300 Laverne. We will be joined by Assembly Member Laura Friedman, who uh, sponsored and really uh, spearheaded uh, AB 43 passing. Uh, 36 different street segments are getting reduced speeds because of uh, this. Uh, you can start to see them now around town and I want to congratulate the engineering department for where they put uh, a new speed limit that is lower. We've got a couple of red flags uh, on top of those uh, speed limit signs. Uh, at 10.45, we will do a ceremonial unveiling at the corner of Laverne and Toledo 
of uh, one of those new uh, speed limit signs that are lower. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing an awful lot of people from Toledo uh, present at that. Uh, next, I want to make uh, some comments uh, on behalf of Council. With regard to some of the controversy that's uh, occurred uh, based on actions that we took here in uh, City Council uh, on March 24th. And there has been a tremendous amount of reporting uh, in the media regarding uh, the universal basic income or guaranteed income uh, proposal uh, that came before us. Uh, what we approved was $200,000 that is going to DAP and QueerWorks for them to build out a uh, pilot and to do the homework that is necessary to complete an application process to present to the state of California. That build out will include uh, doing focus groups, studying best practices, uh, developing messaging, uh, proposing a staffing model, and an application process. None of that $200,000 is going to provide uh, benefits in the form of income to anyone. That is not what we approved. We approved providing funding so that DAP and QueerWorks could provide an application. The application will go to the state of California State of California has made $35 million available for programs uh, such as these across the state of California. There are literally dozens of uh, projects that are being proposed by cities, counties, organizations throughout the state of California. It will be a competitive process that the state of California will determine which ones get funded and which ones do not. That is not a determination that will be made by the city of Palm Springs. We have made a determination to help an organization in our city complete their application process and have the best chance to compete for funds. Individuals uh, who are very thrilled to hear about the possibility of this program and individuals who are very angry about it have reached out to many of us uh, and frankly very confused as to what's actually going on. So we're trying to make it clear. No program has been put into place. No funding commitment beyond the $200,000 has been made by the city of Palm Springs. If and when an additional funding uh, proposal would need to come to us, that would come after the state of California has made decisions as to what they would fund or not fund. All of us who are in public service know that from time to time, people get very, very emotional about decisions that we make. But over the last two weeks, the folks who answer telephones and receive emails and other things on our behalf at City Hall have been exposed to a level of abuse of, frankly, frequently disgusting uh, phone calls and messages. None of the folks who answer our phones who answer our mail, make the public policy decisions for our city. We do on city council. We're your elected officials. If you are angry about something that we have done, it is thoroughly appropriate to talk to us. But it is not appropriate and it does not help your cause. To abuse our staff, or to insult our families. We will move through this and we will act collectively 
together as a city. Lastly, as I said, there are dozens of projects that are being proposed to the state of California. To the best of my knowledge, there is only one of those many dozens that includes a provision potentially of benefits to individuals in the transgender community. And there is only one of those dozens of programs that are in the pipeline today that has received national attention and has received the kind of uh, anger that the program proposed by DAP and QueerWorks has received. Many individuals would like us to believe that animus against the transgender community played no role in their decision to single out this particular program. That does not carry muster. It does not ring true. What we come to understand and what we believe is that it was animus. We can debate whether or not these programs are appropriately public policy, and we had very much that discussion two weeks ago. And that discussion will continue across this country. But singling out one group for abuse does not advance the interests of the country, the city, or anyone else. Thank you. With that, we have a couple of issues for development of the agenda moving forward. Uh, and I'll identify one uh, I would like to bring forward to uh, uh, the agenda, a proposal that uh, City of Palm Springs be a fast-track city for the advancement of LGBTQ uh, equality. Others? So per our rules, do you need three of us to uh, support that? Um, I, I think if you want to approach it that way, yes. I think this would be a, a fairly obvious thing that we would otherwise um, put on the agenda, likely um, consent, unless it really needs um, more discussion. But, okay. but well, I, I support bringing it forward on the agenda. If there aren't any other suggestions, I would just direct your attention to the tentative upcoming meeting schedule. We do have a fairly um, a good size agenda for April 21st. I um, want to point out two study sessions. Um, the first few we've had have been at the end of the month. That's consistent with the month of April where we have our first budget um, study session on April 25th. Because of the way schedules worked out, we have another study session just right around the corner from that on May 4th. It is a bit of a scramble for us putting the budget together, and because we're doing it on a study session instead of in bits and pieces with um, over the course of regular business, we may get a little more done on the 25th. Um, so some of that is a little tentative, given our ability to prepare all of the budget documents and the direction we might receive from council on the 25th. But that's tentative for now. And then by the time we get to um, the rest of May, we're really a little far out. So please don't um, count on some of those items. We do typically have changes, even on the immediate following agenda, let alone two or three agendas out. But staff is open to any suggestions or direction on other items that we need to prepare. Uh, Council Member Kors. I just want to follow up. Um, Oops, there we are. Um, for May 12th, we tentatively have a CVAP uh, program review. I know we talked about that at our last meeting or the one other. Um, and I think while well, I think we're all on board with you know getting a short update from them, we really wanted more staff analysis. And um, given bandwidth, uh, I think if you know, there's more time needed, uh, given our limited economic development staff at the moment, uh, to do that. 
um, even if that means potentially you know, extending their our agreement with them for another three months, I think that might make sense instead of trying to cram something in that there's just not the time to do right. right? I think this has been going on a long time and um, other things have come up and you know, there's staffing shortages like everyone else that you're trying to hire. Um, so I'd be comfortable kicking that back uh, in order to make sure you, know, you and staff have the time to sort of do some analysis on this and we can really think about this in a more comprehensive way. Uh, thank you. That, that, that is helpful. Um, I know we had made some similar notes last time we talked, so that was going to be one of the items that wasn't going to come back um, as urgently, but we may need to at least catch up on the funding arrangement so that we can take that additional time. Um, but those are helpful notes. If there's no disagreement from other council members, we will certainly take that approach. If there's no other business before us at 11 p.m., we will adjourn and uh, we will reconvene at 530 in open session on April 21st. Thank you, everyone. Please be safe.